all of the sessions will be moderated. So this morning, Brona uh, Travnik, with whom we are collaborating now for 23 years. <laughs> and uh, I believe this is uh, a real person that, uh, to be here and to, to represent our efforts in, in this field. So, uh, we're going to introduce uh, uh, each uh, of the speaker and um, we'll at the end uh, moderate a uh, half an hour panel um, where um, we can also uh, pose questions uh, from, from the audience. It is meant to be um, a rather, um, let's say, debate. Uh, we would like to have a debate uh, here and um, immediate reflection on the contributions because uh, this is also uh, why we decided to ask for texts after the symposium because uh, the text can reflect what was said here and um, what was discussed here. So, uh, so much for now. I'm uh, Martin here to introduce our first uh, speaker, and so we we'll officially start with our event. So, hello, everybody. Thank you, Yuri, for, for this introduction. You said uh, we should stick to the schedule, but we're a bit late already, so we want to have a relaxed panel, uh, good contributions, and then uh, I hope good uh, panel discussion. I think uh, you gave me a very <laughs> demanding task to, to present also the great side from our collaborations. So, Oron Katz, he is the co-founder and director of Symbiotica. And Symbiotica is the center of excellence in biological arts at School of Human Sciences at the West, University of Western Australia in Perth. He was a professor at the Royal College of the Arts in the UK. We also know that he, together with Ian Azur, founded the Tissue Culture and Art Project he edited and authored many books and even more book chapters. So we all know Oren Katz and now I'm giving the floor. We are speaking around the field, defining the field, so Oren Katz will open this, this panel. Thank you. Um, so yeah, again, thank you, Polona, for introducing me. Uh, thank you, all of the organizers, for inviting me to talk to you today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, the field and kind of using the prerogative as being the first presenter. Uh, I will explain my view of the whole field of biological arts, and hopefully I'll have enough time to also uh, explain why I titled it Promethean Art. Uh, but before I start, I would really like to acknowledge the Nunga Wajak people here in Western Australia. They're the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm talking to you. I wish to acknowledge their strength and their continuing culture and offer my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And it's really interesting to talk to you from a land that was never ceded and where so much relationship to land and life uh, has been going on for thousands and thousands of years in ways which are very, very different to the European ways of thinking. And um, I would like to thank the Nunga people for allowing me to talk to you from here. Um, so in 2017, I've been asked by Rosie Badiotti to define the field, and I thought that that might be an appropriate way to start my talk by giving you uh, my entry to the post-human glossary around the field of biological arts and living arts. So I see it as an artistic practice that involved the use of living biological systems. In most cases, biological systems, those biologi biological systems are manipulated and or modified by the artists using technological 
or engineering biology as opposed to traditional modes of biological intervention. Yeah, so I wouldn't claim that uh, bonsai or flower arrangements are necessarily considered to be a, a form of biological arts, but that's debatable. Um, it's linked to the notion of emerging knowledge and emerging technology. So the new ways of dealing with life is really what most of the artists working in this field seem to be interested in. Biological art seems to work on the spectrum from the speculative to the actual, from the hyperbole to the disappointing, from the techno-utopian to the contestable, while using living biological systems as part of the process of art making. Human relationship with life or the idea of life or the concept of life is going through some radical shifts. From the submolecular to the planetary, the cultural understanding of what life is and what we're doing to it uh, is lagging behind the actualities of scientific and engineering processes. From synthetic biology and regenerative medicine through neuroengineering and soft robotic um, to geoengineering, life is becoming a technology, a raw material waiting to be engineered, thus providing a new palette of artistic expression in which life is both the subject and the object of the manipulation. Within the realm of uh, science and engineering, radical approaches of, to life driven by mindsets of control seems to be taken haphazardly exposing unintentional ontological breaches. So the scientists are not really trained in understanding the ontological uh, chasms and, and breaches that they're generating through uh, the manipulation of life and through those new understandings of life. Um, so this calls for an urgent need for cultural and artistic scrutiny of the concept of life. This scrutiny goes beyond the human to involve non-human agents through direct and experiential uh, engagement, and this is what we try to do here at Symbiotica. Biological arts deals with the theory, practice, application, and implications of the life sciences, creating a platform that is actively engaged in raising awareness by proposing different directions in which knowledge can be applied and technology can be employed. This can be seen as a cultural scrutiny in action, articulating and subverting the ever-changing relations with life. Much of the work of biological artists seems to be transgressive, trans trespassing into areas where art usually shouldn't go. Yet it is often does little more than culturally frame and articulate meanings to the manipulations of life that have became, become commonplace in the scientific laboratory. So I wouldn't claim that most of the field is somehow creating any breakthroughs in knowledge production, production, but it does play a very important role in making sense and making meaning. The aesthetically driven and confronting treatment of life by artists can create an easy feeling about the levels of manipulation offered to living systems. This uneasiness seems to stem from the fact that the current cultural values and belief systems seems to be ill-prepared to deal with the consequences of applied knowledge in the life sciences. Life is going through some major transformation, even though it, that might be more perceptual and actual. Through rigorous, critical, and playful explorations in life science laboratory, biological arts begin a dialogue that engage with the extraordinary potential and pitfalls of a new approaches to life itself. Uh, however, biological art is not a movement with a coherent manifesto, uh, notwithstanding the 2017 manifesto that was signed by very few artists, some of them are in the room there. I wouldn't, I would still claim that uh, it's not really constitute a manifesto, considering the fact that some of the artists that signed this manifesto are not really following the guidelines uh, uh, in their own writings. Um, I, I see biological art more as an umbrella term to describe art that uses life and living systems as both its subject and its object. Biological art can be seen as critical and tactical media arts in which artists actively critique, question, and problematize these developments, as well as the socioeconomic context in which they operate. Biological art can also sometimes promote transhumanism, but differently to the post-human approach, the transhumanist agenda serves the interest of the human, or some human, in the quest to become better human and transcend through, the, through advancements in science and technology into a seamless imagination of a technological human. Here you can see the work of Natasha Vitamor, the high priestess of the transhumanist who uh, moved into the field of biological art 
uh, claiming that uh, there's no place in this field for artists that have an agenda beside that of life extension. So that's one approach. Uh, following more artists that are working in biological art can also follow more traditional approach. Some biological artists follow the formalist approach in which life becomes a raw material for aesthetic expression, concerns with form, perspective, color composition, etc. Uh, that is supposedly devoid of socio-political context. And the interesting observation about that is that most of the people who are using living biological materials in this formalist manner are actually scientists. Those are people who are not trained as artists, but they are treating the art that is produced using those uh, methods in a very formalist way. Uh, some artists are engaged in public engagement with life science and engineering in which the artists uh, seem to as either raising awareness of the techno-scientific developments or as promoting technological developments and suggesting current and future scenarios. Some initiatives have been actively trying to recruit artists to create public acceptance for technologies not yet realized. And uh, hopefully there'll be more discussion uh, about this point because that's an interesting one. This is where a lot of the funding, especially on your side in Europe, is at the moment the idea of artists as uh, science communicators and as um, promoters of those non-realized technologies. Biological art has links to other forms of art with touch upon life, for example, live art and performance art, where the human is the organism on display and serves as a subject and object. Eco or environmental arts in which landscapes are being manipulated and explored. All these forms of arts, like biological arts, are to some extent ephemeral, transient, in which by the end of the performative duration, they leave relics of remembrance rather than the art object itself. And this is when we think about life as object, and that's again something that we need to consider. Some say some may trace biological art to media arts, where the artist's engagement with new technologies and their effect on bodies and societies are the point of interest. In the case of biological arts, those technologies are of the life sciences and therefore raise some unique, unique considerations, sensitivities, ethics, and application. Biological arts is different from speculative biology, which is the example you see there, in that uh, it works directly with living biological systems, avoiding the notion of the speculative with its capitalist associations. It tend to align more with the notion of materiality. Therefore, biological arts will be positioned in the spectrum of the actual authentic and contestable expression and further away from the from a fictionalized and speculative approach. But saying that there's obviously some artists who are dealing uh, in many different uh, parts of the spectrum. Biological arts is sometimes referred to as bio art. However, the term bio art seems to encompass more than biological arts in that bio art also includes among other things, traditional art expressions that are loosely dealing with the future of life, speculative photoshopped images, and in some cases, other branches of science that are not directly linked to biology. And I know that in Europe, often artists who are working with almost any branch of science are sometimes being referred to as bioartists, even though they would work with physics, for example. Um, I trace the beginning of uh, artistic interest in the life sciences to this image here. Obviously, there's a much longer history, uh, but that seems to be the very first time where the ability of creating life as an object and manipulating and sculpting living biological material was presented in such a way. This is a work, this is work of scientists. Uh, that's a work of uh, four scientists from Boston that um, handcrafted an ear-shaped object out of a degradable polymer and then insert it into the back of the mouse. Um, interesting enough, the cells they were using to grow the ear shape were actually bovine cells, so cow cells. So the only human feature in this whole uh, arrangement or assemblage is the shape of the ear itself, not the biological content. Uh, but by doing so, they evoked something that was um, very deeply entrenched within almost all human cultures. And that's the dream of the human animal chimera, um, which manifested here uh, with this very visible human organ, which is inserted into uh, the body of this uh, nude mouse. And another trope that uh, appeared in that 1995 public uh, presentation of this mouse with Aaron's back is the Petri dish as the stage in which this theater, this new theater of life is taking place. 
Um, another really interesting aspect in regard to this specific uh, ear on the back of this specific mouse is that when the scientists that uh, exposed it to the public, Professor Charles Vacanti, realized the cultural impact of this image rather than the scientific in, uh, impact, he did something quite curious. He, he cut the ear from the back of this mouse and cast it in resin as a museum-ready piece, as a cultural object. Um, obviously, you can't gain any more scientific data from this block of uh, resin with uh, this uh, ear embedded in it. And he was trying to give it to a museum, but at the time, no museum was interested in that. So it's still sitting in his office, uh, which is a great shame. But this is kind of, in my perspective, one of the first really um, strong three-dimensional biological cultural artifacts that uh, represents this new era of dealing with living biological material as a new palette for uh, sculptural and artistic um, possibilities. The ear obviously became a very uh, important trope, uh, and we are guilty of that as well. Actually, the first time we presented an ear, an ear was in Capelliccia Gallery in 2003. That was the collaboration of Unite and myself with Stellac uh, for the creation of the extra ear quarter scale um, that, as we said, was presented live in Capelliccia Gallery in 2013. Um, later, a German artist called Diamond Straub collaborated with uh, Charles Vacanti uh, to create uh, this piece that you see on the right hand uh, of your screen, um, the speculative recreation of uh, Van Gogh's uh, ear. Um, so, but just to put it in context, when uh, Charles Facanti realized the ongoing impact of that uh, image of a mouse with a human ear on spec, he did another curious thing, not just maintaining this uh, um, cultural artifact in his uh, office, but he, in 2006, he decided to copyright any manifestation in any media of an image of a mouse with a human ear growing from its back. So here you can see, this is from the American Copyright uh, uh, Registry, where he tried to copyright, or he did copyright it, um, a mouse with a human ear as a sculpture, as a photo, and as a drawing. And he still believes, because I, I talked to him, I spent actually quite a lot of time talking to him in the preparation, for a show that I curated, co-curated in 2015, um, he still believes that he is the only person in the world that holds the right to uh, capture the public uh, imagination using such an image. In consultation with uh, lawyers, uh, that's not really the case, but the idea that a scientist realized that actually the most important impact of their work was a cultural one rather than a scientific one because um, as far as we know, there's very few, if at all, people that has a year that was grown in such a way. There's lots of complications with uh, reintroducing those types of uh, tissue engineered constructs back into bodies. Bodies are really good in recognizing uh, something wrong, even though it might be the same made out of the cells of uh, the, the patient itself. The body would then go and try and rearrange it. So most of the experiments failed because the ear shaped object ended up being this strange blob that uh, the body, basically as a result of the body trying to reorganize those cartridge cells. Uh, but as a cultural uh, uh, object, the impact of that is, is undeniable. And we are now, I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of the um, idealized social contracts, the, the shift that we went between the 20th century and the 21st century in regard to the role of artists, in particular when it comes to dealing with uh, life and with the knowledge that we generate around life. So we're totally aware of the fact that science is, especially in the 20th century, was seen as a place where verifiable knowledge was produced. Yeah, so in a sense, we can think about scientists as fact makers, or, or at least temporary fact makers, but they are, they needs, any claim that they make need to be verifiable. They're not really allowed to tell us any un unverifiable stories. If they do so, uh, they'll be kicked out of their own profession. Art, especially in the 20th century, was a lie uh, that tells the truth, as Picasso put, put it. Um, the idea of art making sense by making strange was very prevalent, uh, especially around the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and, and by doing so, it provides meanings and cultural framing. Uh, technology and engineering was trying, obviously, to make knowledge useful, translating the knowledge into use, 
and has a limit in regard to how much it can exaggerate. Um, design in the 20th century was very much also seemed to be grounded in facts and grounded in the science and in engineering. And it all was about making needs and wants and translating those, uh, translating meaning and use into desires. But come the 21st century, we see a really strange rearrangement. And, and just remember, those are very much idealized social contracts. They're really more, not so much around the professions itself, it's how we as the public uh, read what comes out. So if, if someone claims a scientist, you would read what they tell you in a specific way. If they tell you they're an artist, you would read it in a different way. If they're designers, uh, in yet another way. Uh, but now in the 21st century, we see that science has a major crisis of reproducibility. Um, we see an increase in scientific frauds and uh, detractions. Science is really the place where the everyday is made strange. So the advance in science really make us question uh, fundamental question, fundamental issues around ourselves. What it means to be in this world uh, is now being confronted uh, almost on a daily, daily basis uh, by the sciences. Uh, but still, we obviously don't allow scientists to tell us unverifiable stories. Art is increasingly become a neoliberal tool to sell innovation, the innovation paradigm. Um, artists are allowed to fake things, so obviously they are um, being used often as a tool to promote uh, hyperbole rhetoric and, um, and claims around advance in science and technology. Um, so yeah, art can openly make things appear as something that they are not uh, and can fictionalize, but now it's being used for someone else or, or in the service of a non-art end. Uh, we see technology in, in engineering increasingly adapting the Silicon Valley's ethos of fake it till you make it. Um, it's really, you're losing, and, and hopefully if I have time, I'll show you a short video that would demonstrate that there's no limits as to how much those stories that are coming out of Silicon Valley or the Silicon Valley mindset uh, can exaggerate uh, the capacity of what they're claiming they're doing. And design is becoming, especially true speculative design, becoming yet another hype engine. And design by its own nature of uh, becoming speculative also lo lost its grounding. Yeah. So there's a major confusion, uh, and increasingly so, between what artists and designers are doing in those areas of emerging knowledge and technologies. And when it comes to life, what we see and what we've seen uh, since the end of the 20th century is the increasing fetishization of technological approaches to life. And those, this fetish of technological approaches to life tend to overshadow the context in which life operates. Yonatan myself wrote quite a lot about it, and we call it neo-lifeism. So it seems that the biological milieu is transformed into an abstract technological instrument of control, where life is just another raw material to be engineered. The contextualized, li the contextualized life has been reconfigured, mixed and remixed, reappropriated and instrumentalized to such an extent that the technologically imagined potential of life stands for life itself. And again, hopefully I'll have some time to give you some examples. So within this perfect storm, we also see something else. We see that human-made technology is starting to adopt quality, lifelike qualities uh, to such an extent that we feel as humans that we lost control over our technologies and over human-made systems. So, you know, we think about our economic system as a very complex system that was created by humans and is now totally out of human control. Think about um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and autonomous systems that we are starting to treat more and more as lifelike uh, systems that are existing outside of our control. And at the very same time, we are attempting to assert our control over systems that existed independently from human influence, and that's life itself. Yeah? So we basically allow our technologies more autonomy as we try to assert our control over those so-called autonomous living systems. And I would add here that also one need to consider the fact that any attempts to try and assert one's control over a system that existed outside of that control is an act of violence by definition. So when we talk about working and manipulating living biological systems, we're talking about the degree of violence that we're willing to exercise against them, not whether or not we are violent. Yeah? So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, 
So saying all that, even with the best intentions, artists sometimes find themselves in strange places. Um, this is an image from a conference that took place in New York in 2018 uh, called Biofabricate. And this is one of those uh, startup meet investor type conferences that are dealing with, uh, in this particular case, with the field of uh, biofabrication, so the creation of new materials using living biological systems and cellular agriculture, which is the field of trying to grow um, basically agricultural products, products and in particular animal products without animals using different types of cells from uh, animal cells to uh, bacterial, fungi, yeast uh, and plant cells. And this whole field really exploded in the last 10 years or so. Uh, but I was extremely surprised when I went there to see that when they decided to have a timeline of the timeline of the field, they started with an artistic project that happens to be a project that Unite and myself uh, developed in 2004. Unite will talk more about the Victimless Letter project. But this is a project that from our perspective was considered to be a cautionary tale. It was a, a questioning the relationship that we're going to form with those types of new approaches to life, what it means to wear leather that was never part of the body, and so forth. And again, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it was enough uh, that we released this specific technology of tissue engineering. And obviously, we're not the only artists that uh, have been working with tissue engineering, but uh, we somehow recontextualized this knowledge and released it from the confines of the biomedical epistemology and by doing so, we gentrified this knowledge to such an extent that the next stage was that uh, the profit, profit uh, uh, seekers uh, realized that this technology can be used for, for other purposes. And here we are with a case where uh, art is uh, signaled out as the tr technological trigger, as the trigger for a birth of a new field. And, you know, that gave both an art and myself somewhat of an existential crisis. You know, what does it mean that 14 years after you produce a work, it's being used almost in opposition to your original intentions? And, and what, uh, what, can be, what can we do about that? Um, we felt that our work was dealing with what we refer to as foresight. And it's interesting to uh, consider the fact that for the ancient Greeks, hope was not a blessing, but an obstacle for realistic foresight. Yeah? So, the idea of hoping for someone for something actually obscured your vision in regard to uh, dealing with the issues at hand. And interesting enough, um, in ancient Greek, foresight is actually uh, translated into Prometheus. So the very same Prometheus that stole the uh, fire from the gods is named after the idea of foresight, the ability to look ahead. But then on the other hand, uh, the name Prometheus has been used for another uh, form of environmental thought, uh, which is Prometheanism, uh, which can be uh, translated into techno-utopianism or techno-optimism. And as an environmental approach, it considers Earth as a resource for human needs and wants, where human innovation and technology would solve environmental problems. Uh, this term was uh, popularized by John Dreisick in 1997, but I think it's quite striking here. Yeah? So we, we can have Prometheus and, and as, as a foresight and Prometheanism as this blind hope that we can somehow uh, use the Earth as a resource and, uh, and save ourselves from the uh, problems that are generated by technology to start with, with throwing more technology at it. So yes, Prometheanism, I, I suppose, is about trying to find the balance between those two. And, and, and this notion of Prometheanism um, has been picking up, tipping up so much in the last uh, few years, especially through those fields of biofabrication and cellular agriculture, to a ridiculous extent. So what I'm going to talk to you now are not really about art projects, but it's about how this mindset uh, that was somehow and somewhat influenced by artistic practices and speculations, uh, it became so strange. So this is a scientific paper uh, that was published by MIT engineers um, last year, where they talk about the prospect of growing wood in the lab. Yeah? So not just growing meat in the lab, but now they're talking about growing wood in the lab. And within this paper, they talk about uh, the fact that uh, it'd be really great to grow wood in the lab because then we don't have to deal with those unwanted or unusable parts of the plant anatomy, such as bark, small twigs, roots, and leaves. Yeah? So why do we need to grow a tree? Because no trees are really bad for the environment. If we can grow the wood in the lab and why 
Do we need to even think about those unwanted things like roots and leaves that, you know, maybe they forgot, but roots and leaves are what produces the nutrients and deliver the nutrients to the wood. But somehow the lab is becoming this magical place, this Promethean place where we can create something from nothing. Because if we don't have roots and leaves, we would somehow magically create nutrients in order to grow this lab grown wood. Um, and, and this is kind of related to one of the things that we are seeing where if in the first industrial revolution, we, one of the main outcomes, or one of the most uh, interesting kind of philosophical outcomes in a sense uh, of the first industrial revolution was the transfer of labor from sentient biological agents, be it workers, slaves and working animals uh, to non-sentient machines. Yeah? So that really led to such a major shift in our ability to produce uh, but now with the so-called fourth industrial revolution it promises us to bring sentiency to the machine as we talked about this idea of um, artificial intelligence and artificial life that would become sentient beings that can make decisions independently from us and have agency in the world uh, and remove at the very same time sentiency from biological entities through biotechnology and synthetic biology and here you can see a slide or a screen grab from a recent TED talk delivered by Isha Datar, who is the CEO of uh, New Harvest, which is uh, one of the major organizations that promote uh, cellular agriculture and biofabrication. Actually, Isha claims that she's the person who coined the term cellular agriculture. And in this segment, she talks about the fact that you can grow chicken breast or chicken in the in the lab rather than on the chicken. And she says, rather than raise a whole chicken with beaks, feathers, and sentiency. So it's not just the roots and the leaves and the beaks and the feathers that those new approaches to life are trying to eliminate. It's sentiency itself. And that's obviously raising a lot of issues that I think we as artists have to address and question. Because what does it mean to live in a world where living biological systems have no sentiency while machines do? And, and if we want to take it even to a more extreme and a more um, human-centric approach, we have to remember that in many cases, what we choose to do to living systems, we end up doing to ourselves. And I'll finish with uh, this amazing, so the next video I'm going to show you is from a, a real company in the real world selling us something which is so amazing, it is impossible. For some, the sky's the limit. For us, it's a starting point. Because below the clouds, there's a world crying out for change. A change to using less land, less water, to transforming industries that have become leading causes of climate change. At Air Protein, we focused on meat. But to fix it, we couldn't just fix the process. We had to create an entirely new one. So we made meat from air. Introducing MetaMeat, a new food category pioneered by air protein. Using novel technology inspired by NASA, we convert elements in the air around us into protein using cultures, then turn those proteins into any meat imaginable. It's where cutting edge science meets bold ambition to reinvent the way we eat. Because we're not in the business of baby steps, we're here to take leaps. Leaps that let us transform the future of sustainable food with solutions we never thought possible. Leaps that deliver us to a world where meat is delicious and nutritious, and making it is carbon negative, massively scalable, and uses exponentially less land and water used today. And leaps that reimagine our relationship with the environment to ensure that it's something worth passing on to those who come after us. And if you join us on this relentless pursuit for more, Changing the world will soon feel as natural as taking a breath. So, yeah, so just to conclude, those types of uh, new approaches to life leads to this strange exaggerated ideas of the magic of those new technologies, because basically what you're talking about here is magic rather than um, anything which is grounded in any reality of both biological and physical systems. Um, this is what we refer to as uh, the 
metabolic rift technologies. And Yunat might be talking a little bit more about it, uh, but I'll stop here. And I don't know if you have time for questions or if we'll just uh, jump straight to the next talk. So thank you so much. Thank you, Oron. Thank you very much for this uh, lecture, which I think very nicely opened uh, the topic, um, addressed many issues that we will address in the panel later on. For us, all the questions will follow after the fourth talk of this panel. Now I'm going to introduce Yuna Zhu, who is the co-founder of Symbiotica, as we heard, uh, based in the University of Western Australia in Perth. She's also an academic coordinator of Symbiotica, and she's also chair of the fine arts discipline at the School of Design at the University of Western Australia. She was a visiting scholar at Stanford University and at Harvard Medical School. And we have your Zoom already here, so I'm giving her the floor. Please. Hi, I hope uh, you hear me. Um, yeah, it's a bit uh, weird to speak into the, yeah, the vacuum. But um, hello, everyone, friends and new friends. And I wish we could be with you in the flesh. But yeah, we're living in this small country called Western Australia, where we cannot, no one can come in and we cannot come out yet, hopefully in the future. Now, um, I will talk, uh, the title, the talk, Automation of Care. And you'll see that some of the things, some of the themes are um, corresponding to a Ron's talk and some um, actually uh, probably um, um, evolving somewhere else. But uh, let me start by saying that this presentation, in this presentation, I would like to illustrate some of the issues concerning with the endeavor of automating care as it relates to the presentation, collection, and archive of living or semi-living art. There are, a couple point, there are a couple of points that share similarities between issues of automation and presentation, again, collection and archive um, of biological art. The those are the requirement for decontextualization, the removal of unpredictable variables in order to maintain care. So uh, in order to illustrate those points, I will use the notion of the incubator, both uh, in a very literal and conceptual sense to guide my talk. So life arms evolves through an interplay of existing traits and their adaptation to changing environmental conditions. Many organisms opt to keep their inside shielded in near optimal condition in order to sustain their biological function through homostatic equilibrium. Human technology enables artificial environments to maintain life outside its original context in situation where it could otherwise die, or just in order for them to grow, to grow fast enough or in abundance for human wills and desires. In other words, humans have developed artificial bodies or territories to support life out of context, what we refer to as neolife, some life or parts of life, fragments of bodies such as cell tissues and other life grown life depend on carefully controlled artificially simulated conditions. Without constant technological support from the prov providers such as the incubator, this form of decontextualized life will die. So the incubator is a simulator of bodies and a homostatic um, surrogate for life out of context, out of place, and out of agency. In other words, it's just like a bio art in a climate controlled art gallery. So, Oran spoke a little bit about the neolifeism, but it occurs when the fetish of technological approaches of life seem to overshadow the context in which life operates. Technology applied to life is becoming their fetish. The technology becomes, stands for, um, and becomes the life itself. And here I'm using the images to show how um, biological works are decontextualized, um, you know, further and further away from the presentation to the um, a collection and the archives. And this is uh, the example of the pigments. But, um, 
I would like to use, you're all familiar with this um, beautiful um, animal uh, called Dolly. Um, on the left side, you can see Dolly with her mom. And on the right side, you can see Dolly and her daughter. And um, in the context of cultural display, let's think about Dolly that I consider in many respects as a, a biological art artifact in a way. Um, Let's think about the display and the, um, if you want, the archive of such a, um, an artifact. So in the context of cultural display, there is an interesting shift in the relationship between and the fusion of natural histories and cultural history narratives. As a result of a shift in biology from a scientific to engineering pursuit, life and living system are becoming raw materials for human end and as such crossover from the natural context to the technological and cultural object. Take the case of Dolly, which we all know is the first cloned mammal from an adult animal. On the outside, there is a problem because Dolly looked like any other sheep. However, she became the foster girl uh, for human technological advance, advancement. Um, if we position her in the natural, natural um, quote unquote, place of museum, hence the Natural History Museum, she will be no different to any other once living specimen. Instead, Dolly is a stuffed Dolly was put on a revolving circular stage, looking straight at the viewer with some scattered hay under her legs. And this is at the Edinburgh um, Museum in Scotland, obviously. The stuffed animal did not represent its species, but was rather a unique historical te techno-scientific wonder. It was not positioned in the natural history wing of the museum, rather it stood near steam engines and selection of computers in the science and technology or innovation section. Dolly the sheep, the mammal cloned from an adult somatic cell, was put on a circular rotating petri dish surrounded by other technological kinds. So how does a museum display Dolly's techno-scientific heart and wonder if she looked just like an, any other ship? It is merely by moving her from the context of the living world to the realm of the human constructed machines? Is it by fetishizing the technological approach to life rather than emphasizing Dolly as a ship with her own agency and Unwell. This is a prime example of the autism. And the Wealth and Trust collection have gone even and further in this place from a whole antenna to a fetish. You can see here the feces is on display, and the image of the feces of Dolly can be now. And I just thought that Boris Gross, um, this is from uh, Boris Gross' book, uh, the idea of art documentation is extremely relevant um, for this. So a look in this is that modern age clearly has, on the other hand, strategies for making something living and original from something artificial and reproduced. And then on the other hand, yeah, we can make it, make it possible to transform the artificial into something living and repetitive into something unique. So Dolly and many of the bio, um, biological art uh, works are playing about this artificiality versus um, you know, unique and, and living and vice versa. So um, Again, uh, the, the three points that I would like to continue now to look through as I talk about um, incubator is the idea of we have to decontextualize life when we present it. We have to remove the unpredictable variables. So it's starting by you know controlling it, but eventually if we want to collect or preserve, we're going into death and automating it in order to make it easier to present, but also to you know, replicate it in uh, different contexts and different places. So back to the incubator, a bit of history. Um, 
the techno scientific body, um, which outsourced living female reproduction body, can be traced back as more than 3,000 years ago. The Egyptian using the heat generated by poop, by camel manure, um, to uh, warm the eggs, and by that mechanical incubating, um, sorry, and by that making the production of eggs um, more abundant and all year round without the need to, um, to have the hen. So this is the beginning of automation. And mechanical incubating known as the artificial mother uh, was invented in 1747 by René Moore in Paris, in Paris uh, France. And again, we have this magic machine, um, or, you know, as Aron said, the lab is a is this kind of wonder place where you put things in, and in this case, eggs, and somehow um, life is coming out, the chooks are coming out. I think, you know, this is, again, the idea of um, decontextualization, the idea of um, standardization, um, which is something that living systems are not very good on, uh, means that uh, factory farming consider nature as an obstacle to be overcome. And the first commercial incubator was developed, that you can see on the right, by Charles Hesson in 1881. This early invention enabled eggs to mature without the need for a hen, as I said. And they also enabled year-round supply of chicken. Um, and um, it become, by that life, chickens become industrial con commodity engineered by human technology. And many of you know about this um, um, a, a story, the story of the first premature human incubator for the people who don't know. Uh, the first time that they were introduced was in the context of entertainment and freak shows. Um, the same technology of the chicken incubator was adopted in the 19th and 20th century for humans' body. So um, it's not, again, a technological uh, um, development as more as, um, um, if you want, how do we articulate the same technology for life that is human? And, um, OK, so the incubator was modeled after the chicken incubator by Stephen Tarnier, but uh, Dr. Martin Coney, a European physician, promoted the idea of mechanical incubators through presenting them in expo and freak show. And you can see here, other example, people had to pay to view the wonder inside the incubator. And you can see the design of the incubator is very important here. It is done to promote, to, it was done with the aesthetic of show off. So people can actually see the light inside the incubator. So the um, aesthetic is extremely important for the display of the um, artifact, such like in biological art. So the, la the later development of the human incubator is intriguing be um, because uh, how it was positioned within, perceived, and understood and presented to society. Incubator aesthetic and the design of the packaging in which the abstracter womb simulated resided, resided had much to do with capturing the public imagination and played a major role in the articulation of the lab inside the machine. So the incubator has a, the machine itself has a, a very important role, the aesthetic of the machine is also articulating a cultural value. Ooh, we all know about you know, the, the uh, public imagination in regard to artificial womb, and this is one presentation. And this, um, an actual um, a research into artificial womb is happening in my university here in the University of Western Australia, or happened. I think now they moved to Singapore. And uh, the main difference between artificial womb technologies and uh, premature in babies incubator, it's the attempt um, on top of the incubator to replicate the synthetic placenta. So the development started in 1958, um, 
uh, when uh, Westin et al. cannulated the umbilical vessels of seven pre-viable human fetuses in a warm perfusion chamber and connected these to spiral plexiglass film oxygenator prolonging the life up to 12 hours. Um, and then, current, as I said, current research that is happening now, you can see in the video that I hope will come, and you can see it here. I'll just press on it. And let's see if it will come. No, it's not coming. So what I can tell you, what I like about this video, oh, it's coming, is, let's see, here it's coming. Again, the machinery, the sound, um, the whole apparatus around it in which the lens is positioned. And um, I think it's quite. It, you know. I think it's quite provocative when you see the actual life. And this is important because um, Kemp and Yusuda, the researcher of the artificial womb, um, were invited to Ars Electronica Festival that all of you are familiar with. It is about uh, one of the famous, uh, the richest festival about art and technology, art and science, to present uh, the artificial womb that is uh, poetically um, stand for ex vivo uterine environment, which means Eve again, um, to present the, the research in Ars Electronica, and this is how it's represented. So you can see that um, you have all the apparatuses, all the machine, however, this time, the only bodies and labor on stage are the machine ones. All other biological bodies are concealed, and as they're unpredictable, and probably um, makes us, you know, uh, raising a lot of kind of ethical considerations. Um, is that the way to preserve living and semi-living life? Or is that just neo-lifeism again? And I wanted to use this image to show the progression in the way we are treating in incubator or bioreactor. So on the left, you can see the one from the uh, earliest 20th century, and the apparatus has a lot, of, the aesthetic is extremely considerate um, to show um, a kind of uh, public imagination, uh, wondrous ideas, as well as function. And on top, you can see uh, the first uh, um, a, a tissue flask by Alexis Carell and the ritualization around that. And on the bottom, you can see today's um, um, flask, tissue flask. And again, they are streamlined. They are um, about um, to create as much industrial um, quantity to be as much efficient, to step into uh, incubator in the most efficient way and create less, as less emotional uh, reaction or visceral reaction in the viewer. And so, again, in order to show um, um, biological arts, it's better to automate the system because otherwise you have to be there all the time to maintain and look after the life um, in the gallery. And this is the first. Uh, attempt of Oron and myself to um, create an automated system in the victim's ladder pro project that we did. And it was shown at the MoMA and uh, as part of the context of a exhibition uh, about tomorrow and how artists, designers will create um, um, technologies and innovation for a better future. And the idea was to have this system autom So we came to New York, to the MoMA, and set the automated system, and it could run by itself. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for us, um, the system didn't work. After a few days, um, the life that was growing um, created an embryonic body, which actually um, Plugged the, clogged the system completely, and we got a call from the curator who asked us, "What should we do? You know, the um, the artwork 
doesn't look the same it looked before and it's overflowing and we told them well you know what you do you have to turn the system off you have to um stop the, the this kind of artwork from leaving and um what happened is um quite uh, interesting because uh, the curator um paul antonelli uh, went even further with this notion um, how, in this sense, she killed an artwork, but literally killed the artwork. And again, this is a very symbolic um, act because, as you all know, when you brush your teeth, you're killing more cells than um, cells that grown in this artwork. But the artwork represents, you know, the future of life that will be automated. And as we know, as we're starting to feel it now and into the future, um, automation and life don't go always hand in hand. And there are always um, problems. There's always um, um, victims. And there, are, and there is many times death. And also, um, you know, when you work with life, there's always the unpredictability, and this is the time when the artwork got contaminated, and Oron uh, had to administrate uh, med uh, medication to his artwork, to our artwork, in an uh, exhibition called Medicine and Art. And this is it. And again, we completely de decontextualizing it. Is that what we need to um, collect in the end? Is that piece of um, um, polymer with some cells over it actually reflect the whole story around it? And I believe that um, Jans Hauser might talk about it a, a bit further. So uh, how much time do I have? Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes. Excellent. Okay, so compass cubato, going back to uh, the incubators. Um, this is, so we decided that we want to try to uh, work with incubator. And in this, um, uh, in this case, we decided to use actually, if you want, um, biological and natural processes to create heat in which cells, uh, in to um, heat the incubator in which cells will be um, grown in. And in this piece, Vessels of Care and Control, the compost incubator, we relegated the care and maintenance of cells from the mechanical, electrical, cybernetic feedback system to a living care system maintained by the bacterial activity of breaking down the organic matter in the compost. The heat generated by the compost used to heat the incubator um, on top of the compost pile. Inside the incubator, we had the plastic cells growing. Potentially, and you can see the system here to understand how it grows, and this is the recent one that we, uh, we've done. Um, and as you see, put, um, what we've done here in the three three SDC uh, um, exhibition that is happening now here in Fremantle, we actually put sensor um, inside the incubator, inside the compost, and everything is monitored. Um, and you can see the sensor on the right side. So in a way, we don't have to do what is, um, the viewer is doing here. We don't really need to look at the cells anymore because we get the information um, through uh, the automation of the system. And this is the one that we've grown in London, in Freeze in London, um, a, as part of the Science Gallery exhibition. And potentially, we aim, we aim to grow muscle cells or in vitro meat, which uh, discussed a little bit by Oron, inside the incubating, creating meat using, if you want, compost technology, and we even worked with uh, scientists um, and the experiments you can see here, um, we actually manage, uh, we, I mean, we, uh, and I'm including all the um, life forms inside the compost, all together we uh, created, actually managed to look after cells for a few weeks in the gallery, okay. uh, sorry, not in the gallery, <laughs> in the outside of the gallery. We brought actually the lab outside um, to the, uh, we 
brought the lab outside into the um, the garden of the, the science gallery um, institution. I won't go into that, um, but again, the idea of neolife is that we can now create meat with no body and without a parent. And um, it is, again, neolife because you need the whole technological apparatus to keep it, to make this kind of meat. And again, what do we keep in the end? Are we, um, what are we presenting and what are we collecting? People are much, the, the amount of meat that we create is so tiny. That is the mise en scene that around it and the story that around it that become the main, um, um, the main things that um, people are looking at. But I would like to say that we human artists were just elaborating on a non-human animal, this is the manifold, the Australian bird, which is a notable for large nesting compost piles constructed and maintained by the males in which the eggs are incubated and the lack of parental care during and after incubation. Basically, the female um, um, just put the egg in the compost and the male has to look after the compost, shifting things around in order to keep the same temperature of the compost for the uh, chick to develop. And once the chick are developed, they're coming out of the compost amount and basically never um, meet the parents at all, which is in a way maybe a fantasy of some um, feminists who are supporting uh, the idea of artificial womb. Um, the incubator can be, uh, again, simply described as an isolated environment that controls heat, humidity, and in some cases, additional elements such as gas content, pH level, and other environmental conditions. It is a homostatic, feedback-based dynamic surrogate body that shields fragile life from the external environment. And this is the incubator of today. I saw you so many beautiful incubator and we you know, ended up with an aesthetic of a square kind of beige looking um, um, box, if you want. And we call it the aesthetic of invisibility, which is very ideological. Uh, it may serve to make the cells and tissue devoid of agency extracted and abstracted from the, uh, the body from which they were derived, as well as from the body they have become. In addition, it renders the technology invisible and therefore neutral or even natural, like Mother Earth, without any footprint on the environment, an autotrophic artificial mother. And again, it's very good to bring Royce in this uh, situation because um, he said art becomes a life form, whereas an artwork becomes non-art, a mere documentation of this life form. One could also say that art becomes biopolitical because it begins to use artistic means to produce and document life as a pure activity. Indeed, art documentation as an art form could only develop under the condition of today biopolitical age in which life itself has become the object of technical and artistic intervention. In this way, one is again confronted with the question of relationship between art and life. And indeed, in a completely new context, art in the age of biopolitics defined by the aspiration of today's art to become life, life itself, not merely to depict life or to offer it art products. Um, which is questionable. Um, yeah, I also put uh, this piece by Rona and myself called For Art is Like a Living Organism, Better Dead Than Dying, uh, because I do uh, think that this is a very interesting question in, time, you know, in terms of uh, presenting and um, preserving um, biological art. And again, this is from a Samuel Butler book, not something that uh, we invented, but it has a very interesting aspect when you think about biological art. And in most of artwork, I can tell you that the art presented was mostly done during the exhibition. Uh, so 
this is homage to Martha, who will talk after me. But the question is, what life is chosen or forced to be put in incubator or to be presented or preserved? And again, you can see here the decontextualization of, uh, the, of the work of Martha from a whole incubator or, or life support system of uh, her manipulated by butterflies to um, just the photograph of the butterfly or the actual butterfly pinned into um, a, a, a wall, if you want. Although I know Martha never actually did that. So uh, again, I want to finish with a provocation. If anyway, we are moving toward more and more auto uh, automation um, of our bio uh, bi biological art um, exhibits. Uh, maybe we should take it even further. We may as well let the machine do our archiving and reflect our unconscious or conscious biases and anthropo anthropocentric fantasies of control. And I think I'll finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yonat, for this very interesting talk which, as uh, Yuri said, would more fit into the uh, panel uh, caring, uh, how's the title? Is Sorry. anybody caring in for, there? Caring for the field. However, I think uh, she also contributed a lot to this panel with the topic uh, defining the field. And she actually brought us very close to what Jens Hauser is going to talk. And this Jens Hauser, we know as a curator, I would say, first. He's also an author, writing a lot, and he's a researcher. Currently, he's a Bear Paris and Copenhagen based. He says media studies scholar uh, and an art curator focusing on the interactions between art and technology. He's a researcher at University of Copenhagen, and he's also a faculty member at Michigan State University, where he co directs the Bridge Artist and Residency Program. He's an affiliated faculty member at the new the new University, Krems, a guest lecturer at the University of Applied Arts, Vienna, and at the University of Innsbruck, as well as a guest professor at the University of Paris. So the floor is your scenes, and the discussion follows after the fourth talk. Thanks you for inviting me here back to Capelica Gallery many years. Um, after I went here last, and it was a very remarkable experience when we co-curated with Yuri this horse blood transfusion by Aurete Obje. I think that was the first time I was, the last time I was here in 2011, so it's more than 10 years back. <laughs> and of course, we have to acknowledge um, also the place here, <laughs> and the place is very special. I think a lot of paths have been coming together in this Kapelitscha network over the years, and it's not a coincidence that we have this family gathering right now here. <laughs> of course, it's impossible to talk about all colleagues, friends, and estimated um, artist uh, projects I would like to talk about. And also, I know that there is this documentary film about Maya Smreka's work that has been developed as part of the project, which is quite important. And that's why I also decided not to talk about this, because <laughs> it's a very special documentary film and research project. And I hope we have the opportunity to talk about this independently. <laughs> and then, of course, um, I talked when encountering also Marta de Menezes and other friends back. Uh, we met in 2003 at the Art Biotech exhibition in Nantes in Le Lieu Unique. And I was just telling that uh, I was uh, um, uh, contacted by the Mart Museum in Lisbon because they're tracing the history. And we're talking about the importance of building this history, the building the archive. And I just remembered that, well, at this time, I still filmed 50 hours of film. There is tons of documentation, and it has never been really archived. Nobody has really taken care of that. And maybe we have to wait the 20th anniversary in 2023 to actually make the film 20 years later about the exhibition in 2003. So this project is, of course, very timely 
family. Recently, there has been a conference that, uh, organized by the Get Research Institute, Materia Viva, Living Matter, um, in Mexico City. And a lot of these uh, issues uh, treated were concerning also materials of art, uh, organic materials in art. But there's only one paper that was mine that was actually dealing with biotechnological art in a whole scope of 40 or 50 speakers that is not representing a lot of weight. So I even the more highlight very much the importance of this gathering here today and tomorrow. <laughs> so um, the title refers, of course, to some of the art projects already mentioned. So I will argue that biomedia art that appropriates and subverts the most recent and diverse technologies of the life science, such as cell and tissue engineering, genetics, micro molecular biology, neurophysiology, synthetic biology, but also involving self-experimentation and transpecies relations, updates its first sight, the kind of art historical trope of aliveness, of creation when it comes close to life in a very little and biological sense. <laughs> and while museums and collectors traditionally deal with the ontological paradox that aesthetic representations made out of that matter indeed appear as alive, such strategies fail with regards to artistic modes that insist on the authenticity of their staged biological agents, functions, and processes. And such contemporary practices often even willfully challenge institution status or art depositories or cemeteries and thereby constitute also cases of a new kind of institutional critique. <laughs> So from this uh, background of uh, media theory, art history, and science and technology studies based on two decades of cultural engagement and experiences in this field, my ambition here today is first to address the manifold fields and ways how bio biomedia artworks, uh, which insist on the authenticity and its inherent functions and processes, <laughs> pose unprecedented challenges in terms of staging, transport, and conservation. And um, second, I want to share a short overview of case studies from my own curatorial practice and self-critically also reflect on related successful or unsuccessful experiences. And then third also, um, up. yeah. My aim is to address the notion of micro-performativity, which I have fruitfully worked with as a media and art theoretician and as a creator as a conceptualizing tool over the last year since 2003 in order to analyze and discuss alternative animated agencies in biomedia art and performance art beyond autropocentrically established criteria such as intelligence, consciousness, or language. So it will appear then that the general shift from performance art to performativity in art also makes comparisons between archival modes of performance and body art and or choreography on the one hand and performative and biomedia art on the other quite problematic. <laughs> So unlike previous concept-based art forms employing organic matter or putrefication processes in attempt of material semantics, since two decades art has been shifting from representation via materials of the organic to stage presence of manipulated organisms, functions, or systems that go hand in hand with the manipulation of various non-human and technical scientific agencies of microperformativity involved in such artworks. And moist media art with wetware remains largely devoid of any institutional advocacy, even more still media art using software and hardware. And while the conceptual challenges are philosophically quite inspiring, it appears that in the about 20 exhibitions and festivals I organized in the fire within this realm, most energy is absorbed by negotiating lab infrastructures often more than a year in advance endless legal paperwork, uh, shipping problems, and technically maintaining literary life art. And from a cultural standpoint, of course, this means that the large part of an exhibition budget is absorbed by regrowing rotten and fragile ephemerals, since works of the threshold of necropolitics or of what I call microperformativity constantly face the threat of contamination, deterioration, death, and disappearance. <laughs> 
So it is indeed suitable to make uh, um, to, 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 to place the contemporary uh, challenges in a larger historical context first, and the creation of lifelike appearances has always been a persistent feature in art, from early anthropomorphic statues and myths of artists' works coming to life to notions of artwork as an organism in itself, to robotic software simulations on digital media, to more recently artistic art artifacts created in techno-scientific contexts. And by means of form, um, material, process, art has imagined, represented, and mimicked, then simulated, and quite recently actually manipulated living beings and systems for real sense genetics, tissue engineering, DNA chips, and so-called biobricks have entered the practice of the repertoire of artistic strategies. So today, mainly three primary typologies of alive artwork exist and sometimes overlap. First, representation and concept-based contemporary art, often including organic matter. Then, of course, presence and process-based dry media art using software and hardware, such as informatics and robotics, to simulate lifelike behaviors via media that are not biological. <laughs> And of course, third, what we are interested most in here, presence and process-based moist media art with wetware that uses biotechnical methods to manipulate organic systems and organisms. So um, the three categories, of course, um, the first category <laughs> includes the use of biological materials such as bodily fluids, food, or intentional purification processes in an attempt to attribute a semantic value to unstable materials. And the potentially fragile works are likely to pose serious challenges for discipline shipping, but above all for preservation. <laughs> However, a large part of these issues can be solved through established best practices for conservation treatment <laughs> that claim universal applicability, for example, a methodology such as popularized by Barbara Applebaum's publication from the year 2007, which consists of first characterizing an object, including its history and ideal state, following by the creation of a realistic treatment goal, accompanied by complete documentation of all steps. So this is what contemporary art is already at. <laughs> Then the second category can be addressed according to methodologies for preservation and reenactment of performative digital and time-based media art. And uh, these have been recently developed as the urgency for uh, conser conserving and collecting technological art has been recognized. For example, in Bernard Serec's compendium, Digital Art Conservation from 2013, or by the Matters in Media Art platform supported by the Tate, MoMA, and SF MoMA to deal with works of art that have been moving image, electronic, or digital elements. The Guggenheim also runs a platform with similar assistance, and here software and hardware conservation, accompanied by interviews, are key when faced with rapid technological um, uh, obsolescence, deterioration, and future and compatibility. So process and communication-based art, often with expanded concepts of artistic authorship, quote Berat Serence, reduce the hitherto valid collection criteria of longevity, authenticity, and intrinsic value of absurdity. Oh, sorry, to intrinsic value to absurdity. So now the third category, and this is what we are about here to talk. So the third category lacks any coordinated methodology, since these practices cut across many disciplines from art to natural history museums, medical and design museums, media art and performance festivals, biotechnology and bioethics, and are still only supported by a few collectors ready to engage with the subsequent challenges beyond conservable objects. So some of the challenges of biomedia art may present similarities to those of performance art, especially as their actual presence may not only be to reenact but to survive in the form of um, documents or physical remnants. However, the various non-human and techno-scientific agencies of microperformativity involved in such artworks destabilize human scales, and this, I mean, both spatial and temporal, as the dominant plane of reference and aesthetic experience and link together the machinic and the organic, as we have heard in the first two representations already. So the shift from organic representation to biological manipulation results in technical, institutional, regulatory, legal, 
um, ethical, bureaucratic, philosophical, and aesthetic issues with regard to museum infrastructures, the status of living organisms, tissues, GMOs, their fragility when maintaining, conserving, reenacting, or shipping them. And as we'll see, for these cultural institutions remain um, dramatically ill-equipped. And I've myself tried to outline and to structure these challenges in the chapter in this forthcoming book by uh, Rachel Rivink and uh, Kendra Road, Living Matter, the Preservation of Biological Materials Used in Contemporary Art, following a three-day conference held, as I said, by the Getty Conservation Institute in 2019 in Mexico City. <laughs> However, both with regards to the second and the third category, we may trace back uh, significant changes that have already occurred earlier with the general shift from objecthood to process-based art linked to the cybernetic paradigm in the second half of the 20th century when Lucy Lippert in 1973 uh, three, described a phenomenon she coined the dematerialization of the art object. The accent was here certainly less put on the absence of any materiality than on the greater focus placed on conceptual artistic thought in connection with processes rather than on collectible objects. And similarly, Jack Burnham's Beyond Madame Sculpture from 68 uh, uh, anticipates what biomedia art will become in an area of technical media competence, interest in scientific insights, awareness of ecosystems, and the desire to biotechnically create aliveness. And Burnham examines the evolution of sculpture here over the last 2,500 years and states that art's survival will depend on its transition, quote, from a psychically impregnated totemic object toward a more literal adaptation of scientific reality via the model or technologically inspired artifact, then to life simulating systems through the use of technology and away from biotic appearances toward biotic functioning via the machine. So we are here in 1968. So influenced by cybernetics, environmental concerns, and Ludwig von Bertalanffy's system theory and biology, Burnham hopes that such art will encourage spectators to adopt a holistic view and develop environmental consciousness, not contra but qua technology. It is, however, unlikely that he anticipated the incredible variety of consequences for staging, conservation, and transport inherent in biotechnology-based art today. And that exploits, uh, this art also exploits a very large spectrum of characteristics that the notion of life brings about, and it's a very contextual term, such as listed here in Bernhard Rensch's epistemology-based biophilosophy. So for, or for, or we often, often think of activity, metabolism, growth, reproduction, mutation, and to which characteristics do artists apply technology? When, how, and why? So within what I will call the epistemological turn in art today, the emphasis artists selectively put on chosen characteristics of life also serves as an indicator both of the philosophical and techno-scientific context within which they operate. And Rensch pro provides a very complete definition of life manifested by a sum of characteristics, including some of which can also be found in the inanimate world, necessary criteria, none of which, however, is a sufficient criterion. So I don't want to go through the list, but uh, of course, we want to know which characteristics of the living are being emphasized, when, how, by whom, and why. <laughs> And for example, practitioners of dry robotic media art may emphasize activity regulation and irritability. Uh, those with an interest in digital simulation of populations may be on reproduction, evolution, and mutation. And practitioners of wet biotechnological art may be on metabolism, dynamic stability, or protein-based materiality of the displays. So these preferences reflect onto the chosen art media with which the uh, respective agents of aliveness are then being coupled. <coughs> And in turn, these preferences translate in the most diverse and constantly emerging difficulties regarding staging, conservation, and transport. 
And however, I personally think that these changes should not be seen just as a straightforward problems to solve or in order to enable museums to stage two, three or four dimensional living images, like some theoreticians have been talking about living images. But phenomena that once took the form of artistic images are being fragmented into a variety of instances of mediality for which I personally have developed a grid of analysis coined biomediality and that needs to be considered an integral part of the aesthetic object, including the challenges prone to disrupt museum routine. So, of course, an ideal case scenario in which a work of biomedia art uh, may seamlessly shipped and staged alive, be functionally conserved in its potential to be reenacted whenever needed is a rare exception. And despite diligent uh, curatorial work, which requires time and effort to be spent negotiating specific, uh, specific local lab infrastructures, sometimes more than a year in advance, one can hardly escape endless legal and bioethical paperwork, perpetual shipping and customs problems, manifold technical, ethical, legal challenges to maintain literally alive art alive. And so, for example, when you look at this category of the transport of the work, including actual organisms, organic matter, biological samples, uh, genetic sequences, plants, tissues, can often not be handled by regular art shippers and instead of biomedical companies must transport them from lab to lab. And additionally, customs declarations may require different details to be reported when such art travels across international borders, uh, conforming to national policies in regards to biodiversity, ethics, veterinary, phytosanitary or pest regulations. <laughs> When we look at the staging uh, part, uh, biomedia is technically most challenging when artists insist that their work has to be shown alive. And then this often overexerts and sometimes voluntary challenges the museum's abilities to provide the needed infrastructures for works uh, that fall outside standard display methods. So regular care, maintenance by trained assistants is necessary. In addition, health and safety ethics regulations for the public display of materials such as GMOs are not the same in every country. <laughs> Living organisms are sometimes euthanized even by museums after an exhibition against the artist's will in order to comply with animal health inspection and quarantine rules. <laughs> even, and it happened to me, after organizing gallery talks that glorify interspecies empathy. <laughs> but they have to be also both euthanized at the end. <laughs> So legally, some works uh, may even be shown only in transit on the way to authorized labs and common practices such as loan agreements or condition reports encounter obstacles when the work consists of largely ephemeral level or perishable entities and uh, customized or borrowed laboratory equipment as in the case of the tissue culture and art project. So at the same time, these constitutional um, limits uh, push artists to consider showing simulacra documentation or remnants uh, instead of the actual live artwork. So the last part about conservation of art that deals with the characteristics of the living, such as metabolism, growth, reproduction, mutation, and falls per se as paradoxical. For example, functional preservation of works may be possible, and I think uh, uh, Howard Boland is there to tell us about that later on, um, in some cases where the artist establishes precise protocols for reenactment. However, an ongoing debate among protagonists in this field is also whether a biological entity should be preserved, plastinated, or taximidide after its performative display. So in some cases, technical solutions are conceived for collectors to preserve the work's apparent aliveness, even in the event of its biological death. And more often, instead of the actual performative artwork, documentation, scores, sketches, and other mediated paratexts are increasingly developed and deployed and produced by artists aware of these institutional constraints. And I want to come back to this notion of the paratext here. And I've earlier in the MIT book, Tactical Biopolitics, uh, um, pointed by MIT Press, pointed to the concept of the paratext as a relevant form, both for the staging and conservation of biomedia artworks. So according to the conceptual grid proposed first by Gérard Genette in 1987, in the realm of structuralist literary theory, um, paratext acts as a, a threshold between text and off-text, mediating the relations between the content and the receiver, quote, to make present, to ensure the text's presence in the world. 
Of course, Jeanette is interested in the relationship between books and readers, but the grid can be well transposed onto a complex intermediate concept of work beyond that of the text in the narrow sense of the word. And in the case of wet biological art, the concept is useful since often works are mainly or only presented via or judged upon secondary text, documentation, and other mediated paratext. So Jeanette defines paratext as an equation of two categories. The paratext is the peritext plus the epitext. So the peritext includes elements inside the confines of the aesthetic object, and the epitext denotes elements outside the aesthetic object. For example, transposed to art, the following paratext could be considered as paratext. Of course, the artist's name, do we deal with individuals, with collectives, with a pseudonym? Uh, what about the work title, artist statements, notes of intention, didactics, gallery size and type, art or science museum, uh, dedications, epigraphs, external quotations, references, parallel actions or displays that act like footnotes intended by the artist. But then we have another bunch of um, uh, factors. For example, as epitexts, the following could be considered. Public epitexts such as reviews, interviews, public responses, media coverage, symposia, private epitexts such as letters, correspondences that are integrated then into the artwork itself in its narrative and in its story. <laughs> So it's evident that this grid could be applied to any kind of art, but here it reveals that the reception of wet biological art very strongly dominates through paratext as such, and such as artists' discourses, declarations of intents, or foot-like additions. <laughs> and this from the beginning. And this is an example that everybody probably in this room knows, but interestingly, even the first reported historical case of genetically modified organisms exhibited as artwork in a major museum already anticipated the entanglement of today's challenges. So in 1936, at the um, MoMA in New York, uh, photographer Edward Steichen showed hundreds of living dephelium plants that he had bred and altered with colchicine, drawing parallels between the um, authentic aliveness of his photography and flower breeding. And the exhibition followed the motto, Art for Life's Sake, and the museum reduced to showing art for art's sake, according to Steichen, was a mausoleum. And Steichen drove the blooms to MoMA in a refrigerated truck, and the display during the eight-day show needed to be occasionally refurbished. The museum took care explicitly, and I have done some research in the archives of MoMA at this time, um, to avoid any confusion. It should be noted, says the press release from this time, that the actual definiums will be shown in the museum, not paintings or photographs of them. It was emphasized as a, as a power text. Right? And the artist's desire to see purposefully uh, genetic mutation applied to plant breeding recognized as art seems to be correlated with shipping and customs issues that he had previously encountered. It is reported that Steichen was involved in an exhibition at MoMA for which he shipped Konstantin Brancusi's Bird in Space, which was refused both duty-free entry into the United States and the status as the artwork because of its lack of represented equalities since, quote, no feathers were visible. <laughs> So Steichen's battle against the $600 penalty is therefore to be seen as the part of a larger battle to redefine aesthetics. However, his definiums were not for sale as art objects, and his MoMA works only survived as, um, um, as unstable uh, photo documentation only before they later appeared beyond the confines of the art market in the form of commercially available affordable seed packs under the name Delphinium Steak and Strain Mix <laughs> that you could still buy some years ago. I did buy some, yes. <laughs> Anik Bureau tried to cultivate them and have some students from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago who have been succeeding in actually reseeding them. So we can probably talk about if this is a kind of kind of living archive. So we are working with some students uh, from Chicago about that. Mm. 
Yeah. So um, half a century later, Steichen has been rediscovered and rehabilitated as a precursor of biotechnological art, as we know by George Gassett, a good friend and a painter who exchanged brushes for genetic plant hybridization in the early 80s. <laughs> and in his installations of inverted Darwinism, Gassert selects plants diametrically opposed to dominant aesthetics and the laws of the market. <laughs> so downplaying human centrality, he acknowledges insects of and wind as equal non-human co-creators. <laughs> and in, he insists on uh, keeping um, his seeds also out of the marketplace and away from art collectors. <laughs> Instead, for him, um, the art to scatter consists of inserting the hybrids into the ecological cycle, sowing seeds, sending pollen or plants to people, or transplanting them at unexpected urban or wilderness places. <laughs> So the following short case studies which follow now are meant to illustrate some of the issues and possible solutions. <laughs> so artists such as the Tissue Culture and Art Project, whom we heard, <laughs> insist that their work has to be shown alive, requiring incubators, peristaltic pumps, lab access, and they also see this as an institutional critique. For example, in the symposium accompanying the art and design show La Fabrique du Vivant at Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris in 2019, they revealed in public previous correspondency, intimate correspondency, with Georges Pompidou's curators. Quote, I'm afraid it would be difficult to realize a living installation work as part of the show Designing the Living at the Centre Georges Pompidou. <laughs> and um, Oren and myself are mainly the bad guys of the conference, and our rent cables have been cancelled. Um, and uh, it was quite a controversial conference, by the way. So, <laughs> Uh, in order to mock large institutions' tendency to make long name-dropping lists to surf on that wave, but not to cope with the needed infrastructures, they staged an ironic work that brands museums as ultimate necropolis. So referencing, as uh, Oyanat and uh, Oren already explained, Samuel Butler's Ear One, their piece for art is like a living organism, better dead than dying, consists of a closed bioreactor where cancerous healer cells grow uh, a miniature figurine shaped after Henrietta Lacks, the person from which the cell line has originated. However, the reactor is specifically designed with limited nutrition and without a waste removal system so that it becomes purposefully a death chamber. <laughs> And another piece by the Tissue Culture and Art Project, Victimless Leather, already mentioned, sparked headlines like murder at MoMA, <laughs> when the bioreactor growing miniature leather-like jackets out of immortalized cell and lines had to be stopped due to unforeseen cell proliferation taken over the apparatus in MoMA's design in the Elastic Mind Show. <laughs> While the art died a month into the exhibition, the institution <laughs> turned the failure to stage the piece as intended into a popular selling narrative. <laughs> However, we staged indeed victimless leather successfully twice, just before and after the MoMA exhibition, as part of the Skinterbases exhibitions in Liverpool and Luxembourg, with infrastructures organized many months ahead of time. <laughs> and indeed, we faced problems of other nature, contamination with bacteria and fungi occurred, <laughs> and to here to fly the artists from Australia for reseeding the price, the piece, <laughs> this very pricey, ironic, and at least very seasonal piece of haute couture. <laughs> and here another interesting aspect is that the question of the afterlife of the grown biotechnological garments, and this was debated between the artist and the curator, resulting in the decision to have the surviving cells plastinated by French preparateur Gilles de Ress, who learned his technique from Günther von Hagens. But we also decided to keep them strictly for documentation purposes and neither to exhibit them in place of the actual piece nor to sell them. <laughs> And in contrast, artist Brandon Ballonji has found a way to both carry out bioartistic research and preserve material outcomes that can be collected. In species reclamation via a nonlinear timeline from 98, 
He aimed at phenotypically recreating an extinct aquatic frog species using closely related ex extant species by resurfacing historically described physical traits resulting in living sculptures. And they live their natural lifespan before being cleared and stained, so a chemical process to reveal the animal's skeletal autonomy consisted of bones and cartridge, then photographed and sold as prints or as conserved specimens, radically released in glycerine, like I have one in my own collection, and where the translucent members seems to gracefully swim when you shake them a bit or when you walk by them. And I'm very happy to hear much more about this project I'm very intrigued by, because for me, an exemplary case of conservation of complex synthetic biology-based artwork is Living Mirror by artist Duo C-Lab, which solves the challenge of optimizing a living biomedia art piece so its function is preserved in potentially perpetuity, so that it can be even sold to a collector in order to function potentially without time limit. So a living mirror uses magnetotactic bacteria's ability to swim along the Earth's magnetic field in order to create a living mirror image of the silhouette of its observer. Once an output image is translated into a magnetic field, the bacteria reorient their bodies in real time, causing light to scatter and create an image in a liquid bacteria culture. <laughs> Howard will correct me on the technicalities if I'm wrong. And the piece conceptually also draws on the myth of Narcissus, who fell in love with his own image in the water's reflection, and at the same emphasizes contemporary science discovery that human bodies are made up of a majority of non-human bacterial cells, hence the mediality of the mirror. So the development of a collaborative version in which the shimmer effect persists over time uh, of several years with, according to the Arctic's, bottles available for replacement in case of anomalies. That means that even if the bacteria die, whatever nanomagnetic chain they created would remain intact beyond their death and therefore seem to be continuing to be alive. Very interesting case study. <laughs> A striking example of how GMO regulations affect biomedia differently across countries within the otherwise homologous space of the European Union and associated countries is Jan Takita's bioluminescent sculpture Light Only Light from 2003. The work is meant to be experienced by visitors in total darkness and consists of a 3D print of the artist's brain covered with moss containing a genetic sequence from a firefly. So confronting the viewer with a light-emitting plant, materializing the historical association of light with life, Takita presents the transgenic as an ambiguous cognitive achievement of the human brain. The brain shape is indeed strongly reminiscent as well of a skull, so as a motif that we have seen in Vanitas and Momento Mori paintings. Initially developed as a fully functioning version, perceivable with the naked eye, for the exhibition skin interfaces at Fact Center Liverpool, thousands of pounds and many months were spent developing the piece with a team of Japanese scientists in the supporting lab in Leeds. But after discussions with the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DIFRA, and just a week before the opening, the Art Center reconsidered the artwork. So despite being double contained in a specially built plexiglass case and displaced in a closed gallery, potential release of spores into the environment could not be 100% excluded, quote, in the event of a systems failure. And even giving, quote, the chance is slight and that if such an event were to occur, it would constitute a category one low case, this was the risk that they were unwilling to take. And as a result, skin interfaces only included non-glowing, non-GMO silmogacra, an effect that was indeed disclosed to audience as a kind of paratext in order to stress the very difficulty to stage such works. A few months later, however, a fully functional version of Light Only Light made its debut as a part of the Article Biennale in Stavanger, Norway. And here the glowing brain sculpture was shown in the lantern room as the only form of illumination at a coastal lighthouse where visitors were invited to contemplate this stunning effect. 
And this time the organizers um, had decided to operate in a legal gray zone by displaying light only light in transit. <laughs> that means that a permit for contained use of genetically modified plants was obtained with the condition that the transgenic moss, after having been seen, sent from Leeds to a laboratory in Uppsala in Sweden, and then driven across the border to Norway by the artist himself, would be autoclaved at the laboratory at the University of Stavanger. So the work was just exhibited in transit. <laughs> But finally, no regulatory issues at all occurred during the next venue of skin interfaces exhibition in Casino Luxembourg. In close coordination with that country's Ministry of the Environment and taking the issue seriously several months before the opening, the venue deemed Takita's piece as not presenting any danger of unintended delays and organized popular weekly demonstrations of the moss glowing in a specially constructed gallery room each time to a limited number of visitors. And Luxembourg's decisions might have been influenced by, the, uh, by a precedent because the official authorization obtained for another transgenic art piece to be shown at the same exhibition, Eduardo Katz's Natural History of the Enigma. And this work involves the creation of a transgenic so-called plantimal by combining human and plant DNA to produce a genetically engineered flower. And here the problem was another one. It was not the GMO, it was not to be able to ship the, the soil with the plant. So the problem was not the GMO, but we didn't get the alteration because of the phytosanitary questions. <laughs> then plant human, um, um, human animal relationships uh, then are even more the complexity of immune um, um, a stage in this well-known performative uh, biomedical self-experimentation may the horse live in me by or que le cheval vive en moi by art duo uh, art orienté objet co-curated here in Ljubljana with Capelitzer gallery in 2011 <laughs> And the, the piece demonstrates well a certain proximity of concerns that biomedia and performance art share. So after several years of preparation, artist Marion Lavaljonté has been injected with compatibilized horse blood to experience immune otherness in an act of transspecies blood brother or sisterhood. <laughs> and the artist turned herself into a probable guinea pig, injecting herself over the course of many months with horse immunoglobulins to develop a tolerance to these foreign animal bodies and to be then injected without falling into an anaphylactic shock so that the horse immunoglobulins would bypass the defensive mechanisms of her own immune system, enter her bloodstream to bond with proteins of her own body, and as a result, impact on her body functions of the endocrine system. <laughs> The risky undertaking alludes to the possibility of healing autoimmune diseases using foreign immunoglobulins as therapeutic boosters. But the performance is also conceived as a continuation of the centaur myth, that human-horse hybrid, which, as animal in human, symbolizes the antithesis of the figure of the rider, who, as a human, dominates the animal. So after the transfusion, La Valjante on stills performed a communication ritual with a horse in the gallery before her hybrid blood was extracted and freeze-dried and later presented in engraved aluminum boxes alongside video and photo documentation, which is, of course, a typical thing of doing it. <laughs> but however, a conceptually hybrid element precedes, accompanies, and outlasts the micro-performance. This time-lapse video, based on the artist's previous immunological research that visualizes in real time the effects on Marion's body, is at the same time a preliminary score, a time-based um, live performance element, and a documentary trace. So I have a triple temporality in this element. So a much, um, and we, we see the time lapse here. I will um, come back to that later with another example, which exactly um, uh, borrows the same principle of a triple temporality, before, during, and after. Mm -hmm. um, however, 
A much earlier piece, Artist Skin Cultures from 96, is curious with regards to conservation and transportation issues. Initially grown out of the artist's epidermal cells grafted onto pig dermis and tattooed with motifs of lab model organisms and endangered species, these transspecies totems were first offered for potential grafting to collectors um, after they're finally they're conserved in formaldehyde and sold. <laughs> mm. The artist proposed me to be one of the collectors, even to be uh, wearing these skin patterns uh, for free. But I was at, at that time still competing in marathon races and didn't want to compromise my immune system. <laughs> um, so, Finally, um, and ironically, although the pieces were made in the United States in 96, they could not be shipped back from France for the Matters Matters uh, bridging research in the arts and science show at the Ellie and Eddie Broad Museum at Michigan State University, Lansing, 2018. Since formaldehyde is flammable, no art shipper agreed to take this on, and companies specializing in shipping biological samples refused to transport the work due to its hybrid animal uh, human nature. This necessitated applying for a special permit from the US Department of Agriculture and would have involved a months long process that we have not had. Um, Previously, however, when shipping the work to Australia, a workaround was created whereby the customs declarations contained slightly different descriptions on the way in and out. <laughs> so while pig cells were disguised under more generic human and animal cells on the way to Australia, only cells labeled domestic pigs were sent back to France, since shipping human cells would have caused legal complications. So it was the same thing, but they were labeled quite differently. <laughs> But I want to just come back here to this uh, hybrid mode of physical conversation in the time lapse video uh, as a multi temporal element that is at the same time a score, a time based live performance, and a documentary trace. To compare this to Paul Vanus's live performances with DNA gel electrophoresis displays called Latent Figure Protocol, but also later in this Suspect Inversion Center, SICK. <laughs> Here, the artist inverts the standard logic of making visible the banding patterns created by gel electrophoresis. That means that analytic laboratory technology um, are used for synthesis, and figurative images are created from a known DNA sample instead of the customary abstract patterns from an unknown DNA sample. <laughs> That means that Vanus generates iconic images which are symbolically highly charged, such as ID, 01, the copyright symbol, the chicken, the egg, the skull, and crossbones, by treating each lane on the gel as a row of pixels composed of DNA fragments, creating a two-day grid of bands resembling a low-resolution bitmap image. <coughs> One can imagine multiple approaches now how to conserve such work, for example, as filmed live lab performance, as a time-lapse video with the emerging motif, as an art book, as we did, by the way, uh, the fingerprints book, where you have the upper part, which is actually a flip book that makes the uh, motif emerge as a motif, and then you have the, the down part with the text, so it's a two, two-fold book in a way, so this is a kind of remediation, how to reconstitute this work kind of art talk in a um, processual book publication. <laughs> Or you could think of other um, um, as a set of materials, just chemical biological agencies and instructions of how even other performance, uh, performers could reenact the process. I personally still keep a package of DNA, primers and probes, cyber safe DNA stain, agarose and so on for a motif uh, pulled it in, in Denmark, a Danish crown in my collection at home. But actually it could also unfold as fixed objects like here, such as light boxes. And these light boxes Paul produces consist of a transposition of the final gel from electric phoresis procedure onto photographic film illuminated from behind. But they also contain the recipe of the process itself. And this is interesting. And here, as is it the case in our Oriental Grace object time lapse video, we have here at the same time a score that matches the preparatory work combining digital simulation and hands on experimentation with DNA uh, pH levels and different temperatures, like in the kitchen. <laughs> And then we have the live time-based performance during which the artist usually explains the recipe to an audience. 
And finally, the documentary trace is inscribed as well by the list of enzymes for each row on the photograph film of the light boxes itself. You can see this in the bottle. So you have the recipe in the final result. So you have the same model of a, a, tri a triple um, temporality embedded in all the art forms, be it uh, pre previous, be it temporal, uh, live, through the live performance, or being in the conserved object. <laughs> So a last um, and the worst case scenario consists of a loss or a theft during transport resulting from the use of companies not specialized in art shipping nor offering adequate insurance coverage. So let's take Tanya Duff's cryobook archives from 2010 as such an example. The cryobook archives are frozen sculptures made of human skin. And it takes weeks to prepare the packages to meet international shipping standards for biological samples. And they can only be shipped from one lab to the other. And since no art shipper was willing to transport living biological samples on dry ice, as required for this work, the pieces shipped via FedEx from Canada to France and simply disappeared in transit. <laughs> And while the box with the dry eyes arrived, all the fleshy sculptures were missing without any explanation. They had been last tracked at the Fedup Hacks in Memphis, USA. It must be the fall of Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> The artist speculated that maybe an underpaid chain worker believed this to be a pure precious organ worth thousands of dollars on the black market, or that customs state authorities considered the art piece to be suspicious and infectious. And here the statement that Tanya wrote, uh, here again can be seen as an important paratext of the work, a paratext in this case, which denotes elements initially outside the aesthetic object, but which can integrate according to the context the whole exhibition history, so to finally become an integral part of the work's narratives as such. I mean, I've been uh, spending four or five hours with, um, with Tani uh, in, in this French art center to actually call up FedEx, to call up the university and send to find out where the samples were. So Concordia University considered suing FedEx for the loss, but finally preferred paying 25,000 Canadian dollars to enable the artist to redo the work for them not only to live in memory, but uh, on us through photos and videos. So it becomes clear that the aforementioned challenges surrounding biomedia art strongly resonate at different scales with issues encountered when performance art shifts toward a general trend of performativity in art and now increasingly including other than human agencies. And this is what I want to conclude by. Uh, we are ending up discussing currently the notion of microperformativity as described, and I brought a sample here just for consultation. Um, it's unfortunately already sold out. Um, in our special issue co-edited with Lucy Strecker for the journal Performance Art. And we define um, microperformativity as an art practice and theories of performativity to destabilize human scales, to redefine what art, philosophy, and the techno science actually consider a body. <laughs> And as such, the inclusion of aliveness enlarges the scope of the evolving field of life arts. It's one end. And non-human agencies are being staged in relation to techno-scientific or even algorithmic systems, addressing contemporary dynamics linking the organic to the machine. <laughs> And for me, the neologism microperformativity has emerged progressively from all this year's long observation and epistemological scrutiny of how and why art since the 90s has appropriated a large variety of um, available biotechnologies to stage aliveness, including in vivo and, and in vitro work. And interestingly, we just made a compendium of um, what kind of different agencies we would, even in this limited scope of what a, a journal number can cover, how many agencies we came across. <laughs> and we just compiled few of them, right? But of course, we can't get through all of them, but there was etum, extraterrestrial organic matter discussed, protocells, of course, DNA, um, artistically created psychotropic molecules, volatile organic compounds, <laughs> Cyanobacteria, chemoautolytic bacteria, fungi, bodily fluids, um, xenopus, zebrafish, microfluidic machinery, artificial intelligence uh, based deep learning networks, algorithms, and last but not least, but viruses. 
The funny thing is that we had the call of paper out before the pandemic arrived, and we had probably 80% about proposing pieces about bacteria and the microbiome, and we had nearly none about viruses. So how good are we at being epistemical indicators or are just following the trend? So some self-criticism in this field is more than welcome. <laughs> But interestingly, the piece that most dealt in, uh, that was Tanya Duff's piece she wrote for the issue about speaking with viruses. <laughs> but then a piece by an Indian writer about how traditional uh, cultures fight zoonosis by imitating the viruses by wearing bird masks. <laughs> So a kind of traditional transmission of uh, empirical knowledge used in Indian cultures in order to anticipate how to avoid the spread of zoonosis. And this was a very interesting case studies because it was very contemporary and it was very historic at the same time. So um, Chris Salter, I mean, this eclectic list resonates also with Chris Salter's um, statement that Mm. And this bon mot, resuming the pervasiveness of the performative turn today, bacteria perform processes, scientists perform experiences, <laughs> algorithms perform actions, humans perform gender and sex. The question is, what or who nowadays doesn't perform? <laughs> So uh, for our issue of microperformativity, Salta has designed a map that structures the epistemes of performance into this kind of coordinate system of references between performative artistic actions, cultural techniques, contingent construction of meaning, and also the last dimension, of course, performity in science. And interestingly, it is in the last square, the performativity of science, that Salta situates the notion of microperformativity, linked to material agency, performativity of experiments, and the intervention of agencies at large. So a last example I want to quote, and a good example, I think, of how this criteria can be combined in how Salter analyzes the so-called post-human sound piece self by Australian artist Guy Benari, featuring a rock star in a petri dish, playing together with a human jazz musician. Here, lab-cultured spiking biological neurons are generating sounds connected to electronic machinery, a kind of neural synthesizer. And for me, the piece is of a particular interest because First, because it is tempting to sum up all possible issues related to transport, staging, and conservation for this particular case. The need to culture live neurons before reenacting the piece, the technical infrastructure, uh, they go much beyond the confines of a traditional audio recording, which would be otherwise to be the most evident form of conservation for a sound piece. And second, I think it's important because it combines a very explicit sense performance of performativity are divided. Because while in the notion of performance, um, in, in this notion of a performance, it puts an emphasis on presenting something to an audience, most often still a, via a, a human audience. On the other side, the notion of performativity highlights the execution of whichever action or process as such. Here, for instance, the spiking nerve cells in the techno-scientific apparatus, while the main purpose of the non-human performativity is not the encounter with the audience. They give a shit about the human audience. <laughs> So to conclude, it is therefore worse to further scrutinize the conceptual difference when shifting the notion of performance to performativity. And German cultural theorist Hans Rudolf Felten sums up the magic of the performative as being processual and transformative, anti hermeneutic instead favoring corporal presence and effects of presence over representation and representing, being antagonist of ontological and essentialist definitions, while not only focusing on discursive features of an artwork, but on the processual features, able to analyze the hybridity of cultural phenomena and of intermediate connections, expressing uneasiness about authorial intention, and rather focusing on the reception and audience of a performance, meanwhile linking the material bodily aspects of culture with its symbolic meaning. And related research areas much go beyond 
uh, re, uh, performance studies in art, but compromise also analysis of rituals, speech activity, the performative or text, gender studies, media studies, and sociology, as well of the philosophy and science. So it becomes clear with this criteria that the challenge of staging and conserving traces and documents of performance art is indeed multiplied in the realm of microperformativity in art, now increasingly including um, um, other than human agencies. But again, um, um, these difficulties with regard to staging conservation transport are inspiring and are pointing to profound changes in contemporary art practices to institutions' incapacity to adapt and evolve accordingly. Because, as I said before, these phenomena that took the form of statistic images before are now being fragmented into a variety of instances of biomediality. And they, again, need to be considered as an integral part of the aesthetic idiom, including all the challenges, intended or not, prone to exasperate and disrupt museum routine. Thank you. Thank you, Jens, very much. We'll have a discussion later, but we're having a very rich panel. I'm really glad. <laughs> so now I'm going to shortly introduce Howard Bolland, who is the fourth speaker of this panel. Howard Bolland is a um, multidisciplinary research-based artist working with biological and digital media. His innovative research in synthetic biology has produced novel visual expressions in bacteria culminating in the UK's first ever art exhibition featuring living genetically modified microorganisms. He is co-director and co-founder of the internationally recognized art science collective and organization C-Lab, which we already heard about today. And his interdisciplinary artworks have been exhibited and presented worldwide. So I would like to invite Howard to take the floor, but I think he just... went out for a... Or Oh, okay, you're here. <laughs> I thought you were running around. <laughs> okay, so please. please Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me as well? Great. All right, so uh, firstly, uh, just speaking of the ends, who I admire, he's a great contributor to the field, he's written so much, and it's really useful for all of practitioners to, to just get some of these insights and uh, immediate dairy, especially when we do research and, and kind of want to hold strong. So that's, that's really great. Also, uh, Warren, who I, you know, he's, he's kind of far almost to, the, to this uh, area. So uh, it's also great to hear him talk about him. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, so as I already said, my name is Howard Bowman. I'm part of the UK Art Collective called CLAB, together with Laura Chinti. Uh, so we've had a shared interest in uh, science, and particularly biotechnology, in the context of art. And that's why we created CLAB. So uh, it's through that engagement that we kind of started dwelling deeper into bio-art in both our research and practice. So we both actually did a, ended up doing PhDs in this area. Uh, so in terms of my own background, I come from a mixture, uh, so I, I'm a practitioner, a theorist. Uh, I come from a mixture of degrees in art, science and technology. Uh, and as a collective, uh, we have been involved in a range of activities, not just exhibiting and producing work, but also trying to organize events, uh, workshops, etc. So uh, it's, it's not like a, a single thing that we're working on. My, uh, my own focus has been on the modification of biomatter to create living artwork. And this is what we refer to as bioart, but it's not really clear if this, is, if this is a good conclusion of what bioart is. And we've already seen people like Paul Van Luis who is using more discrete elements of life, which is not necessarily living, but derived from the living, um, as, as a type of art. 
Um, and Bayard is, is by no means a certain field. Uh, it's, uncertain, it's an uncertain area where art meets biotechnology. Uh, it deals with living matter from uh, a post-biological perspective. So what is the post-biological perspective? It's all these material conditions that emerge from modern body biotechnology. Uh, examples of what we've already seen, tissue culture, tissue engineering, uh, genetics and nanobiotechnology. And uh, how artists, including myself, find a place in this vast field uh, of the biosciences suggests that there are lots of different readings of bioart depending on the type of engagement you have. Uh, but it's still a very uncertain area. Um, it's a practice that tends to kind of evolve over time. It changes alongside technology. It's not static. So as new discoveries come on board, as new things happen, bioart moves with it, uh, or, or practitioners move with this field, uh, because they have a great interest in, in this, and they want to show their own critique, they want to discover new material. There's lots of different reasons why people engage in this. Uh, so, for us, um, this was also trying to change ourselves from having to rely on scientists to, towards becoming more of a scientist so that we can operate more independently, so doing our own experiments. So, uh, our approach is to incorporate scientific methods and tools in order to manipulate living material as a way of experiencing deeper and often inaccessible biological processes. And that is key to what we think bioart should also be about. This, this experiencing inaccessible biological processes. Uh, and we believe, like a lot of other biologists, that this should be exhibited as living material, if it is living, uh, rather than recording when possible. But there are lots of reasons why, why recordings are uh, useful in this context as well. In terms of, uh, I don't know if these videos will play. Just kind of. Okay. Uh, so there are a, a plurality of ethical positions exist amongst bioartists. However, debates suggest that the need, there's a need for artists to remain vigilant against anthropomorphic uses of biomedia. That is the mapping of cultural meaning onto non-human living system. As an interdisciplinary hybrid art practice that deals with knowledge processes, it impinges on the biosciences systematic investigation of intangible life processes on levels that pertains to cells, proteins, genes, their interactions and expression. And uh, the video that I was supposed to show here was an example from a, a residency I did in Heidelberg where I was trying to make a scaffold move using heart cells. Uh, so the cells we need to attach onto the scaffolds in a particular way and then we would put it in an electrolyte tank that would then be pulsed in order to, to move this scaffold. Uh, and as part of that process we would then have to remove heart cell from, from young mice, uh, early mice sites. Uh, and to do that you have to actually remove it whilst the whilst they're alive to get them a, a fresh material. And working with, uh, with the group there, the technician refused to do it because it, it, they felt it was unethical to, to do for the sake of art. Uh, the work continued, um, uh, and we, we did actually manage to get heart cells in the end. We did, we did see them, uh, but we didn't get so far as moving the scalpel. So I think it's stuck. Oh no. Uh, can I get over to the other side of my mouse? Is it F5? You have yeah. to close the window first. Close the window. 
Maybe you have to throw some. Oh, uh, maybe. I have no idea what that says. to the 2000, or just before the 2000, uh, this, it was a period that was underscored by a media frenzy. We've already seen Dolly the Sheep, and this again is the Countess Mouse, uh, and it was, a, it was a frenzy of it with imagery and discovery that suggested that biosciences was radically transforming nature. And this, is, this was a pivotal, I also believe, I'm not sure, but this was a pivotal point in history that really changed a lot of how art uh, approached this. And artists influenced by this science and opportunity sought to express themselves using a range of different media. From traditional depiction uh, to computer art, the use of file media itself. And one question asked, and I think Jens was probably one of those who asked it, was uh, were there artworks responding to the post-biological uh, using thematic representation should be included in the classification of by art or only those using biological media? And some argued that the use of living matter constituted a significant departure and should be used to define by art. Uh, this is another image you're probably familiar with. Uh, so, by the art, it tends to uh, be delimited by a temporal and fluid subject boundary. And there's been lots of different terms that try to describe this art practices. Uh, I can see that one of yours is probably in here as well. Um, so, we have things like genetic art biotech art, transgenic art, mutagenic art, and these are reflecting uh, on the many entry points and adjoining areas. In the broader sense, bio art encompasses both art and science, but art science has its own shape, uh, with works generally being collaborative in nature and where collaboration between the artist and the scientist tend to be promoted as a positive activity. Even propaganda, uh, science communication, critification, so for scientists, it may uh, hold promises of seeding better funding opportunities, and while for artists, often this intention is quite unclear, the motivation is often instrumental, using the scientist more as a technician. Science art, which uh, Orrin also showed, <laughs> uh, as an example of uh, the, the other way around, where scientists uh, uh, create visuals and present them in the context of art, but this is often uh, uninformed by contemporary art practices, and often, well, despite often involving a highly innovative method of obtaining these visuals, they almost, they're almost exclusively represented in the form of photography. And for scientists to produce, uh, to create a living organism purely for aesthetic reasons, purposes, which I'm not suggesting by much are doing, but if they were to do so within in institutional affairs settings, this would be quite a bit challenging element. Despite that, there has been an ongoing exchange of living organisms between scientists and artists, switching their context uh, from scientific to artistic, uh, ranging from actual knowledge transfer to simply staging these organisms in an artistic context as living um, beings. One could, for instance, argue that uh, Eduardo Katz's GFP value was such, was such a, a, an artwork um, and done through such a process. And despite uh, a lot of early artworks involving a plethora of living organisms, with a few exceptions, including these ones, most of them lend themselves to traditional art practices, uh, depiction, etc., rather than artists adopting scientific method. Such focus on representation alone tends to circumvent 
biological meaning, and it provides limited, if not an anthropomorphic account of biological meaning. So bio art cannot be discussed without accounting for performance artists, using their own bodies as a site to explore biomedia and ownership. Arguably, and I think Jens Haus has probably uh, said this before, there is a structural relationship between performance and bio art connected through the ephemeral nature of the material and their methods of preserving artworks. The subsequent uh, expiry date or cessation of life means that bio often ends up as inert or in the form of documentation. And like performance art, documented by art shares similar reference back to the authentic process, the living or, or its original uh, uh, place. So while it removes the presence of the living, uh, documentation can provide art with a much needed mobility, given the financial, legal, material constraints of reproducing such works across countries and regulatory frameworks. In its brief history, by art has seen lots of different modes of expression. It continues to focus on speculative approaches. Uh, for instance, speculative design is, is it another area now that has is, is, is been blooming for a while, uh, which reveals that the production and the manipulation of organism on the street level is not yet completely within the range of artists outside collaborating with, art, with scientists. The nature of bio artworks has opened a series of questions around authenticity. It's difficult for the audience to verify what's going on. And that has led some artists to stage an authenticity. And we, we saw this with, uh, with uh, some of uh, Orin Platinan and Sir's work. Uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, other, others have actually used this channel to create more speculative art that blurs the boundary between authenticity and fiction. Claims that artists working with uh, uh, speculative or even hoax-like aspects of bio art and are profiting from the impossibility of certifying biological processes as genuine suggest that bio art are tapping into genuine biological processes but are unwilling or unable to disclose such evidence. Uh, I, uh, Certainly, it can be challenging for an audience to verify uh, what the artist claims. And the artist may purposely use, uh, choose to uh, uh, equivocate when it comes to methods or the nature of the work. So the need to stage an authenticity is indicative of bio art involving epistemological and ontological questions surrounding our ability to verify such items. So while many art, by artworks have, have used natural organisms or phenomena, very few practices, there are more coming, engage in the manipulation of biomatter in a formal scientific context. The problem with that is that it throws into question the authenticity of, art, uh, of, uh, of uh, works as the artists often lack evidence processes needed to produce more complex works in the scientific domain. I mean that by, in the sense that you, you start off with an experiment, but you don't need to evolve it to a different level. And, and this can be challenging if you cannot trust your material on the ground level. Um, so and another example of this is, and this is from uh, Art Orchard Berlin, many of you have probably been there, um, they, with, with Rüdiger, um, uh, Toyok, uh, which I had a workshop with. And, uh, and we tried to, we were actually thinking of doing quite a, a complicated uh, experiment, but we decided to do more basic genetics, in, in creating competent cells, etc. The problem that you see when you try to hold a workshop like this is that only doing pipetting is a challenge if you've never done it before. So you end up having to, uh, to really scale down on, on the possibility unless you start evolving this. Let me see again. Yeah. 
So these approaches are needed, so these, these more complex approaches are needed to access and develop practices in emergent technologies beyond DIY, collaborative, conceptual, and ready-made capacities. Those wanting to pursue a laboratory-based practice face a challenge with access that has led many to, to uh, has led many to turn to DIY practices, which has resulted in novel subversion of scientific tool and alternative representation, which is also needed. And these artists reflect on how practices often need to build their own tools, representation and aesthetics different from those born out of the biosciences. And I think I had already covered some of that earlier when she looked at the incubators. However, and this is with the, with the, the London biohackers, -hack and I'll talk a little bit more about them. However, much of the actual biological material, such as tissue, bacteria, and viruses, is under legislation and it limits this type of practice. In addition, the ability to maintain and move material forward, you know, trusting, trusting your instrument to move them forward, uh, uh, is often reliant on extensive, highly specialized equipment. So, uh, I should have another picture of this here, but uh, we work with the biohackers in, in London. They have a hacker space there, and they make their own electrophoresis gels, you know, like they're to, to run gels. And uh, it's it's all um, it's it's more it gets more focused on the instrumentation than the actual biological aspect, because it, 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 that's that's where they can reach. And when you come to trust those experiments, to move your experiment forward. Then, that's when you have a problem. And also they have problems getting like, material, etc. So, so we, we ended, ended up actually taking them to a lab and, and helping them to evolve some of the practice. Um, so whilst virtual representations are metaphorical, conceptual and symbolic in nature, bio on the other end presents the audience with a living. And this is a presence that shifts both the artist and the audience position in that the living matter is expressing an extended capacity of a different order and uh, staged by the artist. So presence here, I'll understand this as what is tangible to the human body in the sense of occupying the same space. There is, a, there is another evidence to this performance, which Jens also covered, is that the material itself is actually performing. And, and if, you, if you've ever felt that you're, you've created, a, you, you've worked on a, on a piece of material and it's not performing the way you are, there is a disappointment of the material also not performing as you intended it to do. Um, so, this, uh, so this present here is something that this has actually led some artists to further break down these separation barriers and stage a heightened fidelity of such presence. It suggests that presence is part of an aesthetic, that by art or by art, and that producing such presence is, is uh, to create an actual experience of the living through media rather than through representation. I used the example that we already seen here. Uh, where, um, uh, as a way of kind of, of staging, staging um, uh, the presence of the living, and, and also I say by talking about the killing ritual, you're, you're staging this this kind of just in the presence. Okay, my own practice has been to engage in a material approach that requires adaptation of scientific methods. In my case, I adopted synthetic biology. I worked with standardized part. Standardized part sounds really good uh, because it consists of libraries uh, where you have lots of G uh, DNA material that you can use. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's still a practice that is evolving and, uh, and lots of the material don't actually perform as one expects, uh, uh, which is something one is aware of, but yeah, it's a problem. 
But my lab practice explores how language, material, and methods can extend artistic, poss artistic possibility through investigating scientific processes. To do this, my scientific involvement had to be profound, challenging, and time consuming. And more uh, than being embedded in a scientific culture, it has been about participating and understanding the material struggle that is going on there. Um, so the process, and I, I believe this goes for, for many of you who work like this, the process is one of, of becoming and learning to think like a scientist. It's an immersion that happens on several levels, on the material level, uh, on a method level, on a knowledge level, and on a cultural level. And there are no clear way of keeping these boundaries distinct. So for an art pr pr practitioner, it involves a scientific overhead, but provides more equal footing with scientists' reaches and open the shared space between the disciplines, but literally attempting to hybridize. So overcoming limit limitation requires artists working independently to acquire scientific uh, knowledge processes, language, methods, and situate a context to provide material and operational access. So I'm going to give some examples, hopefully this will play. So um, for instance, uh, here I use the bacteria donated from the London Sewage Facility. I know that Martha has done similar, some similar work with this type of bacteria, uh, and is able to degrade toxic dye. Uh, by, but in my case, I vary the volume of inoculation, and what, what you can see then is that you have a slow forming pattern or image, if you like, a kind of a biopixel, uh, and the image only appears in an in between state before disappearing, forming a kind of a transient image. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that this type of slowness means that exhibiting this type of work is often having to be supported by documentation as biological processes take time. In terms of present, this shifts are focused from the living and onto the screen. Or looking at a time lapse or something similar, right? Alicia, yes. In another example, here I explored using uh, magnetic nanoparticles. So, uh, and this shows how you can actually stare cells using a magnet. So you can, you can literally hold uh, a magnet, which is what you see when I'm doing there around a the microscope, and I can, I can interact with individual bacteria, which when you think about the scale difference is, is quite a phenomenal feeling. Because it is um, it is important, um, um, but I, I, I might just bring it up after. Um, so actual magnetic bacteria and our common nature. This 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 is truly uh, uh, amazing uh, to me, and they swim along Earth's magnetic field. Or well, they use it to orient themselves and, and to uh, and to kind of either stick to the bottom or they'll find themselves at a certain shift in, in, the, in the water level in their ponds. Um, but if you expose them to a changing magnetic field, what happens is that uh, their body reorients and scatter light. And this light scattering you can see is a shimmer. Uh, and therefore, change, it, it changes how much light passes through. And what we were looking at for the first time was a real-time phenomenon, which is very unusual on this, on this kind of level, that you can actually observe a real-time phenomenon like that. Uh, and when we realized we can control this using magnetic coils, this is when we were able to develop the artwork Living Mirror. So I'm just going to see if I can share this video with you still. Uh, 
apologize if it takes me one minute. It's just it just shows the, the, the behavior quite nice. So I think I think it's worth seeing. So this is uh, uh, using a genetic program that converts alcohol into banana oil. And this allowed audience to experience a strange but quite confusing sensation of bacteria smelling like banana. So artists' access to laboratory spaces can be limited. But to engage in a lengthy study, laboratory arrangements are needed. In my case, it involved a daily laboratory practice and being situated within a scientific context. This causes a lot, can cause a lot of cultural clash uh, alongside a steep knowledge curve uh, that it, it can be experienced by artists entering the laboratory space. And it also provides a clue to why so many of collaboration. There's also a risk of failure involved in genetic engineering which may also explain why so many stop on an instrumental level, creating instruments or habitats, rather than actual being ardent and reaching into the molecular. It's hard, there's a, there's a lot of trial and error. So while bio artworks can involve a great deal of, lear a great deal of learning, there are subsequent challenges that follow when attempting to publicly stage these works. So for instance, in the UK, it involved having me to undertake regulatory uh, work to enable the UK's first public exhibition involving genetic modified organisms. I, had belie I, I believed uh, prior to doing that, that there was many exhibitions that had taken place. Uh, but once you start probing into these things, the, the world might look a bit different to what you think originally. 
Because if other people have done it before, you can obviously use their framework, uh, which is quite helpful. And that's also why it's important to hope for, for the community to try to tackle these things. And because then we can ask each other and we can learn from it. And so as one of my biggest, this was probably one of my biggest challenges at Regulatory to date. Uh, and it features living bacteria with novel visual expressions using synthetic biology. Uh, and if it has been exhibited before, it wouldn't be in a legal, uh, legal way, or maybe it would be in a, trans in a transport uh, transient way. Um, so the other problem that you hit upon here is uh, that regulations vary from country to country. So uh, there is a number of exhibition uh, that has involved, involved GMO that has taken place in the United States uh, on institutional premises, and that's probably the easiest place to, to, to do these things. But as, as uh, some of you already mentioned, the, the problem here is that it's not just about sending your artwork across. You actually have to go there and produce it again from scratch. And that means that you have to go into the laboratory, do all the autoclaving, get your media together, and, and, and uh, undertake a whole, whole time-consuming uh, uh, preparation of the material. And it also depends on, uh, on what type of material you're working with. So, um, um, yeah. So, <laughs> So exhibiting outcomes uh, is quite challenging. My, my first initial UK exhibition involving GMOs was postponed. Uh, I had all the paperwork. Uh, I had spoken to the organizers before. I had spent a week preparing the material. I arrived there and they changed their mind because uh, they, didn't, they didn't somehow didn't connect that this was living material. Uh, and also, they didn't like the word bacteria. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> how, how, exhibiting these words uh, as living is, is very important because it offers a tangible sense of life as it becomes enmeshed in biotechnology. And for curators and organizations wanting to include such work, there is an equal need uh, to appreciate the different parameters that come into play when exhibiting the various type of material. Uh, I contacted, for instance, the Wellcome Trust, and they thought it was the same, same rules of exhibiting tissue culture as GMOs. But there are all nuances in, 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 this, uh, in this field, so uh, that's something to be aware of. So these variables pro also provide a background to why artists often choose or have to exhibit documentation and conceptual objects rather than the living. So performative viral has provided a rich set of debates using uh, metaphors, stage presence of the living, but it also prompts the questions of whether the living presence has any biological significance outside metaphorical reasons, readings, and further suggests, what is then the role of the living if such preoccupation is dominated by metaphorical aspects? So to me, this goes back to processes like eliciting biological states, the, the stress system I, I, I showed you briefly before, uh, where I insert a program to, to see if bacteria, uh, to see how bacteria can kind of become stressed, if they become stressed, they can change a, a color or a light, a emit protein, basically. So in, in this case, I have to follow a chain of events from the depleted food supply into the gene, into the switching control of these cycles, and then enable me to engineer a program that once inserted into the bacteria would make them light up when they're starved. So you, you go through this whole uh, scenario, and, and then here's the difference, right? Um, 
if you take some of the earlier uh, bioartworks, where you are looking at, uh, let's say, the GFP bio, for instance, it's, it's not, you don't know why it's, why it's glowing green. Could be Photoshop, obviously, but you don't you don't know why that is. And and so the point I'm trying to drive at here is that in, we need to get into the kind of ontological discussion of what is going on here. Uh, and and when you that is the biological significance that I'm highlighting. So my position concurs with the importance of presence the presence of the living. However, presence of living matter alone as a play between the real and the metaphorical does not properly account for what is mediated. And by tapping into biological processes, artists may be able to operate beyond this metaphorical and symbolical concerns, where the presence of the living is understood through transformative parameters that reveal hidden biological aspect. And therein, or herein, lies the need to develop a deeper braiding between artistic and scientific practices. Um, I don't know if that showed as well. No, no. That was also, that was also like that. Yeah. Okay. You didn't need this little, yeah, what does it say? Required sex. Required Yes. So, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. This is going to be no. So, this is, this is uh, a use of red person protein on the petri dish, and over time, it forms a pattern. And what's, what starts to appear is these invisible processes become visible to the naked eye as this, as this uh, colony gets, well, many colonies now, uh, gets more and more stressed. And obviously, this, the, the, the center is, uh, is dying as well. Um, does that mean that if I, how do I get back to the presentation? Is that here? Oh, you you know what? Uh, I'll just do it now. I'll just do it to the end of it. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, I'll just go to the end. Um, <laughs> So this this is the other video I wanted to show you briefly. This is um, uh, this is this phenomena I was talking about. Uh, I know it's a little bit outside defining the field, but um, I thought it's worth worth sharing with you as well. Uh, this is kind of like this moment, like for for us anyway, where we found a material that was really fascinating, and, and it's like it gives you so much joy when you do that. Um, uh, and, and you try to understand how it works uh, and uh, uh, how you can work with it uh, and, and what the possibilities are, basically. This is this giant uh, container we used originally. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, this is how it responds to, to magnetic fields, so these are kind of biopixels if you like. Um, and then unfortunately, the, the it, the work kind of um, doesn't last very doesn't last very long, and most of the time this gets kind of contaminated. Uh, so that's that unfortunate part of it. Oh, I want to just carry on. Sorry. Yeah. 
yeah, we've, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, uh, we've done this. Uh, and this, this is the kind of another piece that I, when we spoke about like bioreactors and, and kind of incubators, this is a machine I ended up making in the end to, to kind of keep my bacteria alive and to actually conduct the experiment. And what happens in the end there is that you have a, you have a fresh, uh, uh, fresh media going into the container, then uh, it has got a bioreactor there that basically helps uh, grow the bacteria very fast. And then I, I push it slowly through, through this thing. And it, this actually looks like a lamp, uh, which was purposely, purposely done. Uh, and then into the into the base into the waste. Um, so I can end there, but I just wanted to read my last part of this, which I can just open this and read it, since we have so many interruptions. I apologize. So uh, so working with genetics has never prompted me to consider what type of meaning processes we're dealing with. Uh, because we're, we are engaging with uh, intrinsic system, and they have lots of encoding practices already built into them. And they operate on discrete levels, uh, and behavioral levels, and environmental levels. So unlike this idea of subjectivity, and cultural references, and meaning processes, the use of genetics should not merely be about aesthetic, but as a tool to uh, try to understand the network of interactions that can be tapped into. So we can kind of reveal by all of our chemical state messages and states. So unfolding these layers as an art practice for me is an attempt to move away from an increasing an obsession, rewarding obsession that uses biological organisms only to reflect on the human conditions and do little to increase our understanding of non-human life. So, first, at the beginning, I would like to relate to the title of this event, which is Life as an Object. And partly I would like to refer to what you talked about. In the last talk, Howard spoke, has spoken about, um, okay, of course everybody spoke about uh, life, but Howard spoke about um, what I would say, an idea of surpassing um, subjectivity. And recently, there was a group of scholars who introduced the philosophical branch, which aims at surpassing the Kantian subject-oriented ontology, and at rejecting the privileged human existence over the existence of non-human objects. And Graham Harman coined the term object-oriented ontology. I don't know if you are familiar with that, uh, for this uh, philosophical direction. And later on, Levi Bryant used the term machine-oriented ontology in order to denote the machine-like nature of the systems instead of the objects, which organize life around themselves and are functional so they are not just solid objects, but kind of machineries that organize life around them. So, Howard, your talk and um, particularly your abstract um, emphasized, I would say, a perspective that might be understood as close to that. You said we have to go into an ontological discussion about what is going on here. And you called, you called in the talk for a vigilant stance as regards the anthropomorphic uses of biomedia, the mapping of cultural meaning onto the living systems. So you aim to sublate the idea of subjectivity, the use of cultural references and meaning processes. You suggest to understand our practice as moving away from the practice of using biological organisms to reflect human conditions. So how to avoid the trap of landing back to the mechanistic perspective, which is a possible critique of the object-oriented ontology? So if we are able to move away from our, are we able, if we are able to move away from our human perspectives and projections, I would also say we project our ideas onto what we research or investigate, 
and see the world in a non-anthropocentric fashion, how and where then should we to locate our human position in the world? Can we surpass our subjectivity and what can art do in this regard? You titled your talk, an immersive perspective. Then in your, the talk you explained that you, that you also understand that as learning how to become a scientist, so immersive in that uh, sense. But for instance, Maurice Merleau-Ponty emphasized immersiveness, uh, which <laughs> points us exactly back to this perspective of subjectivity. So, or are we talking about some other stance, some other perspective? You can use this one. So, um, when I talk about the immersive perspective, um, I talk about it almost in the sense of learning a language. Um, and in that sense, uh, the language that you want to learn is something that the biosciences have been uh, digging into in order to understand life on a more profound level. I'm not saying, and I, I know Oren have, um, and Anat have some really good critiques about what is going on as well in the science practices, but it's a step towards trying to understand uh, the material you're working with. That is the type of immersion I'm talking about. Uh, when I talk about um, trying to um, when I, when I speak about going beyond the subject the, the subjectiveness of the human, I see us that we are in a crisis at the moment as a human race and we need to address that. And we probably won't be able to address it. I'm not so optimistic necessarily. Um, but we are in a crisis. And we can't just um, rubble and <laughs> in, in the um, metaphorical anymore. There is, a, there is a sense that we need to actually try to understand what's going on with our world as well. Uh, and I think artists can play a role here. Um, I'm not saying that I'm necessarily 100% successful in it, but it's my attempt to try to uh, move beyond this, just looking at the metaphor and actually draw some understanding out of the living that you can com that we can co can kind of elicit, that we can bring forth as a kind of performative aspect that um, brings some more understanding, some more. Uh, joy, some more uh, um, sense of the world we're living in, uh, is, what, is what I'm referring to, I guess. OK, we, we, <laughs> that could be further discussed then, because we always project the ideas that we deal with, that we have, for instance, if we, you say, enter the world of science, and then we get trained, we also get familiar with some theories, then we, of course, operate with these theories. And when we approach the new material, so to say, or new situations, we always use what we already know and uh, project these ideas onto that. And uh, that complicates this, uh, so to say, naive way of uh, knowing or getting to know or what would you say? Maybe, maybe, can you use this microphone? Maybe uh, it's, it's going to be easy. Yeah, uh, maybe you can unpack that a little bit more. Unpack the, the idea. Yeah. So that if you're an artist or if you're a theoretician, mm. whoever, when you do research, you always operate with what you know and the theories that you're familiar with. So if you are, let's say, Wendy, um, um, in ethnography, when they approach laboratories and then they were kind of fascinated with laboratory life to get familiar how people lived there and uh, how they get familiar with theory so forth. That means it's a whole apparatus that's also theoretical apparatus that you come to live with and you start to use as your own way of thinking and then you project this way of thinking and 
the things that, that you are familiar with and that you understand, you project onto the world and the situations that you get in contact with. So that always, it's always a tricky position of the researcher. So how to get in contact with some situation and get, be able to produce some fresh knowledge, so to say. And I don't know if art, uh, is art a, has a privilege stance in that regard or is it um, maybe because it's not coming from the field or people if they're not coming from a certain discipline, maybe it's a different position, maybe it's even uh, a privilege then to be able to see differently. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, can, I can try to carry on, but does anyone else wanna um, approach that idea? Okay, don't need to, you don't yeah. need to, Howard, I have a question for Oron to move a little bit on, but still uh, stay at this um, post-anthropocentrism, I would say. Um, so Oron spoke about post-Promethean art and also emphasized this post-anthropocentric uh, uh, position, I would say. So if I borrow your uh, formulation, Howard, you said, uh, uh, move away from the anthropomorphic uses of biomedia. However, scientific disciplines very often tend to use metaphors. Anthropomorphic metaphors are frequently used. You also mentioned that, Howard, in your talk. So, um, especially when scientists aim at popularizing science, and or on you also um, when you were and doing kind of taxonomy of uh, of this bio art, if I say so. You also mentioned a very important uh, direction, I would say, in this uh, field of art, which is the task of popularizing science, uh, especially when it comes to funding, that uh, could be a key. And many scientists use the role of uh, art in that regard. So how can art then establish a post-anthropocentric position if he or she engages in a scientific in scientific epistemologies, uh, and in which points do you see the artistic position position particular, and perhaps the artistic epistemology truly different from scientific ones? Or on, um, I know you talked about that. I mean, you even did um, uh, you formalized what you called. Uh, I think social contract of the 21st, uh, or idealized social contract of the 21st century, you said that art can fictionalize. And uh, when you mentioned design, you, you were speaking about speculative design. And Howard said that art is speculative, which maybe we can talk about that later. So art is speculative. Many artists, I think, uh, me and Maya, for instance, wouldn't, uh, for instance, would claim that it's very important that art really does what is said to be done, so that it's not speculative in that regard, to be unreliable with the protocols and with the outcomes and so forth. So, uh, so uh, what do you think? So if art, because you were uh, emphasizing also um, that artists is engaging in very different epistemologies, entering varieties of disciplines, so forth. You even mentioned today some, uh, some uh, in the beginning you mentioned, um, maybe you can also go further into that, uh, some philosophy, so to say, of the native people from Australia. So that could also be one of these uh, uh, entrances, so to say, which uh, contributes to to, to this uh, diversity of epistemologies. So, what do you think can art? What is particular for the artistic position in this regard, uh, and in which regard is the artistic epistemology truly drift different from the, from from the, for instance, scientific ones? Yeah. So basically. What we are talking about is a fundamental question about life itself. And one of the things that we notice both in the lab and obviously outside of the lab is what we refer to as the acute poverty of our language when it comes to life and it's all of its manifestations. So, you know, you, you yourself said that y y if you don't have the tool or the theory, you can't really understand or you can't engage. And, and the problem that we have as humans in almost all cultures, and this is actually where we might be able to learn from indigenous cultures is that we have a very limited uh, set of tools 
verbal tools, language tools, to actually engage with the complexity of life in all of its manifestations. So one thing that uh, Unite and I uh, decided very early in our, our practice is to not emphasize the human life, because the question is more fundamental around the manifestation of life uh, throughout the whole gradient. Um, beside the year project, which was interesting because that was really the, the only time that we were accused of blasphemy. So I, I would say that, first of all, the fact that scientists need to resort to metaphors, the fact that obviously artists are, are using metaphors is an evidence of the inability for us to articulate in a clear way the, what's going on with life, what we're doing to life. And this is part of what we're talking about in regard to those ontological breaches that the scientists uh, are bringing about. So I think the role of the artist is to identify those and, and point a finger at them. Yeah, there's not much, much else that we can expect artists to do beside that. Uh, when it comes to your question about the, um, the speculation, uh, first of all, to do with the importance of uh, uh, science communication in, in the arts, I never said it's important. This is not really my interest. I know some artists, it's legitimate for them, uh, but this is really not what we are that interested in. We, we're very fortunate, and there was a discussion about access to resources, that in the last 25 years, we had unlimited access to a biological lab. One of the reasons we established Symbiotica was exactly to prevent this power structure that artists are facing when they uh, need access to those types of labs. We, to a large extent, were able to uh, bypass it by setting up our own lab within a biological science department that allow us uh, access to our own lab, but allow us also uh, equal access to all of the other labs. So we kind of managed to navigate this power structure in ways that uh, we're really privileged. And, and that we hope, we don't know if it's going to continue, but we hope that will continue and we hope that other artists will have opportunity to have this type of access. When it, when it comes to speculation, so, so what I've said is that by definition, artists have a license to make things appear as something they're not, uh, which means that the default position in regard to any artist, including ourselves, is that you shouldn't trust them. And I think it's a healthy uh, idea to do with almost any other profession in those times. Yeah? So I think healthy skepticism is something which is extremely important. We're being, we being fed with the type of bullshit that I presented at the very end of, the sh of uh, my presentation, this air meet, for example, where it's presented as if it's actually real. Those people went and presented their company to the World Economic Forum. They're presenting their company across the world. So. Um, so, so art is, is kind of the interesting thing because art, artists are not being penalized for not telling the truth or making things appear as something they're not. So in a sense, because we have a license to lie, we are actually, in the end of the day, the most trustable people because we have no interest in telling you that we're not lying. Yeah. Or um, saying that so many artists in our field are engaging in, I wouldn't even call it speculation. I, I would leave speculation to this field of design that uh, you know started about 15 years ago and um, seems to be dying off anyway. Um, but mm -hmm. hoaxes, so many artists do. Hoaxes. Yeah, are engaging in hoaxes and, and it's a it's legitimate uh, uh, form of artistic practice. You know, and, and, and if by doing so they uh, create skepticism in the audience, that's that's another healthy thing that uh, should happen. You know, I can tell you that from our perspective at Symbiotica, what we do. And what we present is what we experience. We, we are like, yeah, we, we are joking that we are kind of the last of the modernists because we try to be as uh, honest to the materials and the processes that we engage with as, as we can. And that's why our work is so disappointing. Yeah? Um, and this kind of aesthetics of disappointment might be uh, the, the only way, you know, and how it was talking about this authenticity. I, I think art is engaged with different types of authenticity. It's the authenticity of the hand of the artist, that's how it always was. It's not the authenticity of the claims. Um, and there's a major difference between authenticity and trustworthiness or, or the, the claims are actually true. Um, so, yeah, so, so when it comes, uh, we, we prefer to talk about what we're doing in the context of the contestable. Yeah? So what we bring out, and this is something that we are trying to do uh, throughout our whole kind of career, is, is, is to bring out what we refer to as contestable prototypes. So those are uh, akin to a conceptual artist who's actually trying to uh, materialize the concept in a way 
that is out there to be contested rather than to be uh, appreciated or admired or, or taken on face value. Uh, we're suffering from another issue where our work is full of irony and the realization that actually there's so many cultures that just can't get irony is, is striking us each time. Yeah, so there's all of those different levels. That I think we, we're struggling. And, and, and I talked about this existential crisis that we have because our work just doesn't hit the mark. You know, <laughs> we, keep, we keep on hitting the wrong marks. And, and, and I don't know if there's anything we can do to change it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, what you said, it's very important that you are, uh, what you do, that it's, uh, you said that your work could be disappointing because uh, then it, it really takes place, what you say that is taking place. So, if there is a contamination, that's also part of it. That's, I think, very important that we have the situation as it is. So, if... Uh, uh, Ionet was talking about the incubator, incubator to, to have an incubator, to have the certain conditions to enable this living, that's very important to really have all that. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense if we would use whatever material and so forth. So now if I move to, to, uh, to you, Ionet, um, you actually touched a very, I think, important uh, topic, which is the biopower. Uh, biotechnology has come to get enormous biopower as the power over life in general, that is the power over the bodies, the power over the populations, as well as the power over the non-human living world, with the ability to cultivate life in vitro, so that's what you talked about. So when we speak about incubator, of course, this is the essential, essential instrument for this goal to be reached. But you actually are interested in a shift and that you say that is taking place in the recent years to be noticed, and that is to obscure the technological surrogate vessels and render them neutral. And you show that example, which I liked very much, so how to really do that and to actually enable kind of autonomous life of this uh, growing, uh, growing entities in this incubational space, so to say. Um, and in your abstract, I didn't notice it in your talk, but you mentioned resistance, so that you recognize a sort of resistance of these non-human agencies. So my question would go in this direction. So if you see this, so to say, shift or the new situation when these living entities are getting more autonomy, so to say, do you think we are getting in a in a sort of post-anthropocentric situation when we have a more equal mutual relationship with non-human agencies or maybe also human in vitro living agencies? That would be one question. And the other one that I would um, also like to address in relation to, to the notion of resistance is... Um, how do you see this idea of resistance of the non-human non agencies, or I think it could be also human in vitro living agencies, um, if we understand the notion of resistance related to humans, so related to consciousness, to, so to say, to ideologies, to some, so to say, political stances, so how could we speak about, or do you think we can speak about resistance of these organisms in vitro? Yes. Oh, again, there are so many ways we can take this answer. Um, I just want to start to say that there are different kinds of knowledge systems. And I think uh, there is the Western way of trying to make sense of the world, which follows very much of a colonialist way. So we're taking things out of their place and put them in the lab and observe them and, you know, kind of reduc uh, reduce them. And uh, that's one way to, and, and sometimes we forget that they're behaving in a very different way to how they behave in their contextualized uh, situation. Um, and there is, you know, a um, different kind of non-Western way of uh, trying to um, make meaning and knowledge which are less intrusive, um, you know, looking at things in context and um, looking at the connection of things, etc. So that's one thing that I want to say. Um, 
resistance. Yeah, um, life, res yeah, we are, first of all, we are life, you know. Yeah. So by trying to be objective and, and try to understand life uh, in a rational way um, is it, kind of, um, uh, there is irony there because we are not rational, you know, we are life, we are emotional, we are, you know, we have our biological bodies and the way that we try to make sense of the world is always in fault. We use technology uh, and automation to try and be more uh, rational, but this technology just take our own biases as uh, we all know. So um, life and non-human life, including human life, will always resist uh, attempts to control and to automate, to automate and to standardize. It just, doesn't work and and i think that's uh something that i really appreciate with living systems that it, it, they just can't find you know they always resist this attempt uh that, that we try to put on them uh including ourselves and um again talking about uh automation because this is an area that we are looking a lot at the moment um it's never completely um automated by itself. There's always labor that involved inside. And the labor comes a lot from living systems, whether, you know, the, the living system in the incubator that are non-human, non-human, non or whether the labor of the, you know, um, of, of looking after the machine, fixing the machine, cleaning the machine. And uh, this labor is called the feminized labor, and it's uh, not to do with sex. It's more to do with the labor that is usually hidden. It's usually um, unvalued. It's um, precarious. Um, and um, I think this is the labor that human and non-human, and especially non-human have, but this labor is always resisting. And we always have revolutions. And I think, um, we have to think about because there's more and more of this feminized labor in our current society, both human and non-human. And um, there is a resistance. And we can see that there is at the moment um, resistance. I mean, even Mother Earth is resisting us, as you can see. I mean, we are in, in time of resistance. I mean, COVID is in a way resistance, if you think about that. Thank you. When you talk about this labor that is invested uh, into taking care of these uh, incubational systems and so forth, wouldn't you say that that's a kind of new parentship? Because you said that there's going to be entities without parents, but it could also be understood as a new sort of parentship. Uh, I think it's partnership. Parentship, so Parentship. Keen relations. Keen relations. Oh, yeah, we always make it. Yeah, and I want to say, um, and you know, we're talking about uh, work is a lot to do with um, care and control. And I think if we want, a, a, if we look at scientists who work in the lab, they do need to take care of um, other life forms in order to control them and vice versa. And, you know, it's again, it's, it's not one way um, relationship. It goes both way. And um, care and control are not necessarily opposite. Again, um, sometimes you're not sure which one is which, etc. cetera. Um, so there is, and I think that's, that's one of the, for me at least, one of the most interesting things about um, working with living or, live, or semi-living system is that there is kinship, there is um, try to communicate, to look after each other, to care and control from both sides. Again, I think the biopolitic is quite clear and we should be aware of it that at this point we have more control, um, especially in the lab. I'm not talking um, what's happening outside in the world at the moment, because I mean, we were, you know, put down on our knees by a, a very small virus for a long time. Um, so, uh, yeah, there is kinship. I think there is a lot of love to life and, you know, rejoicing with, lo with love of life. And, and again, maybe we should really think about um, also, you know, our uh, own way of thinking about death should change because, you know, all we are trying to do if we're thinking about the transhumanistic way 
to prevent uh, death, to prevent contamination, to have control. And maybe we need to rethink those kind of things and say, you know, maybe contamination is actually one of the, the most wonderful things that we can have. Maybe we should just lose a bit of control. And maybe death is not the fight, you know, is, is something that is part of life. And um, so, so again, I think life teaches us how much, you know, the way we see it is very much human construction. And especially for all of us here in the stood in the wherever we are, we are all very much representing a narrow um, kind of Judo Christian Western way of looking at life. And um, I'm always interested in actually different kind of way of looking at it. Thank you. Howard has a comment. I'm on. I'm on. Uh, yeah, I was just going to make a small kind of sub-observation to this idea of contamination. Um, when I when I first walked into a lab only with postdoc and PhDs in the sciences, I was a contaminating factor. I was treated as contamination. I was uh, put into a corner and uh, sort of uh, sh <laughs> sealed off uh, uh, because one of the because they were protecting their experiments. Uh, and um, I remember remember the the one person there. He um, uh, he he showed so much care for his experiments, and I I actually admire that how much. Um, to the point where uh, there was another person who was working with viruses, fucks, and um, he threw him out of the lab because uh, <laughs> another postdoc because he was contaminating his sample. So there is definitely uh, some ideas within the science community, but it's hard to know what type of caring it is. Uh, because they're caring for their experiments, but are they caring for their, you know, is it about their life or the experiment uh, we're talking about here? Um, yeah, just a, just a side note there. Okay, so very interesting. What is the hype, you say, of this caring? And Jens talked about caring for the artworks that really contain living entities. You talked about the shift from the previous representational and representational mode of art to this micro performativity, as you said, and uh, you have this um, issue of performance research on micro performativity here. I think it's a very, very good issue. So it's been sold out. So you can read, read more at this occasion because it's here, or maybe there'll be more copies to get. So. I want to hear from you your consideration about the perspective of an art museum. So we have this situation that you say, and you present it well, how demanding it is to to actually fulfill all these technical, logistic requirements. There are ethical issues. You even talked about some legal grade zones. So that's also an issue that many museums would be uh, it it's of course much easier for a museum not to get into something like that. It's easier to get just a sculpture and install it. So what is the future or the perspective of an art museum? Is it likely that the museums will adjust in order to be able to include such artworks that you say moist media artworks? Or will we only have few specialized art museums that will perhaps also have to contain a laboratory? Well, the people that Howard also talked about this, I mean, problem or uh, important aspect when an artist goes to a foreign a country, you have to work there, so there has to be a laboratory. Uh, will museums have to have laboratories for the artists to work? And how broad this practice is gonna be in your uh, in your view? So, is it gonna cause the the museum to essentially change or and adjust, or actually just the opposite to diminish and become? Uh, the so-called bio art, just a tiny branch of art. 
or does it, this situation remind us of the historic avant-garde and the, the artistic uh, works that were so new at the time that the museums were not prepared for that and never really adjusted to that situation? First, I think I have to be very happy not to work at a museum <laughs> and to be a freelancer like uh, independent thinkers and tinkerers because I think that um, this gives the freedom and that is also uh, constructing networks that challenge institutions and participant agents alike. So I'm not representing any kind of institution and which is, I think, more important. Um, I think it's important that we think of this artwork um, in the tradition of what authenticity is. And Oren Bose and Howard also raised this question, because what is authenticity? When it's a great topic, we can consider that this is an authentic representation of something because it's figurative. It's a 19th century painting that is really mimetic in a very perfect sense that can be considered as authentic. And then the second wave of 20th century reconsiderations of what authenticity is, that not the motif is represented in an authentic way, but the art itself as a process is authentic. So the most authentic work then is the abstract because it highlights the art making itself as being authentic. So the most abstract modernist works are the most authentic in this kind of definition of what artisanity is. And this overlaps with how it says, but um, in how far is the authentic biological process then important? And I think in the art that we are talking about, it is. And uh, it is because it draws to um, the real challenges that are beyond the human confines of this mesoscopic bubble within which uh, our own phenomenological experience are still rooted, which means for me a way out is scaling, right? So microperformativity, as we described, is a way to see microperformativity in relationship to macroscopic effects and to circumvent this, what I call a mesoscopic bubble of a pop song that is two um, minutes and an opera that is two hours and the radius of a dance is two square meters. And to actually to get out of this um, kind of Arthurian man related aesthetics and to, to go to this kind of biosemiotic web that doesn't um, need the limitations of this own anthropocentric scale. And the scaling both in time, is, uh, in terms of time and uh, space is important. Even think of the, the question of how important, let's say, death is for life, not only because of its uh, dichotomic antithesis, but you know, for example, that you, know, you need apoptosis in order to have a living organism to survive. So what is lethal at a certain degree of cells is beneficial and, and, and vital for the organism. This means that shifting scales, I mean, that is a lot of artists work with that. So, oh, we are killing the cells. You're making a kind of ritual of burying the cells. But actually, if the, if the cells are not dying or not having this uh, process of apoptosis that stops proliferation, then you get cancer, and cancer is lethal. It's very good for the cells, but it's very bad for all the organisms. What I want to say is that it depends very much on the level of scaling that you put position yourself. And I think the way that we try to um, make a workaround with this concept of microperformativity, to actually to deconstruct, to consider the human plane as a main um, reference point and plane of reference. And this goes back also to, I think, what biosemiotics does. And biosemiotics is not about consciousness, it's maybe about cognition. And I think if Catherine Hales makes a statement about mm, the non-conscious uh, cognition, it's because bacteria have con cognitive systems. We can learn from bacterial um, systems that construct architectures, which are highly construct, that they do not need to boil down all things that happen in a cognitivist way to uh, consciousness. So I think what we have to do is also to consider non-cerebrocentrist attitudes that also give other biosemiotic agencies away. This is what the uh, reason why I moved to Scandinavia at some point because uh, biosemiotics was very strong in Denmark at this time, uh, namely through uh, Jesper Hofmeyer's uh, my, uh, works. And when you look at these, it's a kind of post-Pierce attitude to make interpretations of the living world, but 
not giving the symbolic the highest value. That symbolic, which makes the interpretation the domain of the gold standard, where, I mean, the interpretation of life processes has to happen. But maybe more on the iconic, or maybe even the indexical level of having sign processes interaction, and not just a master molecule of DNA informing other things, but uh, a cell interpreting another signal. So what I want to say is that um, there is um, a kind of shift from maybe the metaphor to the metabol. And this is also what we have staged with Thomas Feuerstein's work. In this case, it's the museum, a medical museum in Copenhagen, which is a very special museum I'm affiliated with because what it does, it is exhibiting research. It's not exhibiting art objects. The, the main issue of the museum I'm affiliated with, and it's the only one, is that we only exhibit research. <laughs> And when Thomas Feuerstein's algae-generating circuses are coming into play, it's to actually stress this important to make an interpretation, not on the metaphoric, but at the metabolic level. And we look at the Greek um, uh, history of the two words, it's all the meta, of course, but the, the metaphor, if you take the metaphor in Athens, you take the tramway. That means it's a, it's a trans means of transportation of senses, right? But if you make the metabol, it's not only a transportation of senses, it's a transformation. And what we do right now in this art is to move from transportation of senses to transformation of matter that has in its sense makes sense. Life makes sense. We don't need a hermeneutic approach to that. So I think that this inherent capacity of, of sense making is that what attracts me to biosemetics. And what I'm very much um, concerned with when, you come, when it comes to your initial question of institutions is to just come up with long shopping lists of artists without actually trying even to cope with the challenges. And these challenges are not just practical, they are epistemological, they are philosophical. And challenges that Oren poses with the artwork at uh, L'Art de la, la Fabrique du Vivant, I think it was not a, a coincidence that both of us ended up at the bad guys in this conference and speak up and whenever we raised our hands, were more or less silenced down, or people were very scary what we are going to say again, and round tables being cancelled. But pointing to um, the, the very fact that, for example, this big arch that the Saint Garage Pompidou staged of a kind of um, fungi construction before dis occurring, discovering that it was also because of this being linked to the, uh, air, um, the air conditioning system, contaminating the whole collection with spores. I mean, it's quite amazing, you know? And then they dismantled the installation without losing a word on that. It was just not there anymore. It was not made the topic. So what I miss from institutions right now is self-critique, epistemological understanding of the work, and not just to cope with practical problems. And this is, again, I think it's, uh, it's a reason why I would never like to work at a museum. <laughs> okay, but you can have a museum of a different kind that would... Um... <laughs> <laughs> so, you th I mean, so we have, so to say, a problem in the sense that there is a real dichotomy in the in the um, approaches, uh, so that it's uh, all that it's required for really presenting the most media artworks. On the un one hand, on the other, you have this, so to say, traditional way of functioning of the museums that really don't have, want to put much effort in showing that, and that also don't show much will to change change and to adjust. And um, finally, so to say, before I give the word uh, to the public, uh, I would like to open a discussion on terminology and definition of the field, which is the topic of this panel. So in 1990s, uh, Eduardo Katz was mentioned, he coined a term transgenic art to refer to, refer to he said, a new art form based on the use of genetic engineering techniques to transfer synthetic genes to an organism or to living, to transfer natural genetic material from one species into another to create unique living beings. So that was the term transgenic art. Later on, there was a rise of tissue engineering. We heard that today for many times that that was very influential for the art to really grow in the sense to involve uh, living entities in the artworks in the in uh, installation, I mean, in the, in the venues and at the shows. Um, so you even got this name, Tissue Culture and Art Project, or on a neonat, to refer to your uh, art practice. Biotech art 
was a term you used, Jens, to refer to a variety of art practices using biotechnology, for instance, the installation in Nantes 2003. And there, there is also a term biotechnological art used as a synonym for biotech art. And the term bio art is perhaps most widely used and known for the art that manipulates living organisms or what Howard said that uh, is using living components. Um, so while you now speak about biomedia art, Ian, so Ars Electronica used the term hybrid art, which is not used any longer. So do these terms denote different art practices? Is it useful to have more terms to denote the art practices more precisely? Or do we need to switch to a term different from bio art? Is the term bio, biomedia art, Ian, the new term to be used instead of bio art? more appropriate for the same sort of practices that used to be called bio-art? That's a question for all, but maybe Jens, you can begin. Yeah, I think I resisted the term bio-art since the beginning. I'm not subscribing to any manifesto, but um, I think because there are a lot of opportunistic attitudes to get on this uh, fashionable bus and to jump on this bus, because just there's bio out there. I mean, it doesn't make sense for me because we as spectators are bio as well. So there's nothing else than bio art for me anyway, because we as spectators are a functional organic system that is having a kind of perceptual experience that is treating signals. So, I mean, the bio art is already there. Um, I think what is making it different is to create a, spe a specific situation of co-corporality where what I am looking at as a as a kind of as like a second order observation I observe another there is one um, organic system observing another one and this is core corporality and this core corporality can be um, prompted by let's say functions or also a kind of similar material that I resemble these cells or I resemble what's in the petri dish um, why I personally think that the media question is important is because first it allows us to understand why so-called transgenic art came up because at the junction point between digital arts and early genetic based art because they are both speculating on the misinterpretation of the notion of a code and the kind of fallacious transposition of the genetic code in biology to a, a digital code in informatics and we have again a kind of hermeneutic trap of being building um, this kind of synonyms because they carry the same name. I think that Lily Kay has deconstructed in a brilliant way in how far this kind of extrapolation, uh, extrapolation came to structuralism and how structuralism made biologists and linguists talks together. And out of that, we had this early transgenic art, which is fully based on a kind of cybernetic approach to it. And I understand the practices such as tissue culture art as a reaction to that in order to give the milieu a better, um, better understanding. Not the centrality of a genome as a kind of actant, but actually to consider the milieu itself, the medium itself, a greater importance. And when you look back on the terms of media, and Leon Spitzer has done in the 40s a brilliant anthology of where the medium as a term comes from. It comes first from metaxi in Greek, then it moves over to the to the, the, the Latin medium, but it first means a kind of physical medium. It means the ether, then it's absorbed by uh, Lamarck's ontology, the ontolic trilogy into biology, and the milieu becomes a factor, which is important. And then very late, only in the 19th and 20th century, the medium becomes instrumental. It becomes apparative. But the very beginning of the notion of media is the environment. Yeah? So you can think of a media of something that is transforming and generating, like Hitler's definition of being a medium that uh, uh, transforms, that, uh, um, that captures, transmits, or processes information. This is also what genetic engineering does. You have medias of observation like microscopes and uh, stereoscopes and, uh, and telescopes. That means the media in terms of knowledge making. But you also have the initial uh, notion that we forget about, which is mil media in the sense of milieu. And what is tissue culture about? It's exactly uh, uh, organizing living matter through the changes of milieu. Not changing the organism itself directly through engineering, but actually providing a milieu. And for me, therefore, it is interesting 
because the biomedia <laughs> encompasses, as a definition, all the ways all the that ways a relationship between the organism and the environment is being complexified. <laughs> While bioart for bio me is a kind of term that appropriates also simulation and so on, but doesn't ask the real question. And I think for me, the uh, very race of the importance to attribute maybe biomedia as centrality in the argumentation is precisely through encounter with tissue culture based art, because it is there that a different, older definition of media that we have forgotten is taking a central role. Thank you, Howard. Uh, want also to respond, maybe just to say, wouldn't you? I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to be quick. <laughs> okay. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I I quite like this idea as well. There is a couple of things in addition to this. I think Eugene Thacker. Um, address this as well um, when he was talking about by media where he connected it also closely to uh, bioinformatics and there is an important point there also in terms of automatization is that these these um, the media and technology somehow become intertwined at some point you know, as a kind of ontological epistemological space uh, because, that's because that's how we how we, how we move how we move, move with this media how we how we kind of get an understanding of it as well uh, uh, and I just wanted to kind of like make sure that that those aspects it's not just the biomedia here there are other factors that are adjoined into this space as well as you mentioned, Eugen, I think the, one of the very fundamental uh, uh, aspects of Eugen's book from 2004, already Biomedia, as is the the, uh, the the kind of oscillation, the uh, the oscillation between bioinformatics on the one hand and biocomputation on the other. <laughs> And bioinformatics is using, let's say, uh, non-biological media in order to make a real effect on real biology. <laughs> While biocomputing is the opposite, is running real biologs and systems in order to carry out a mathematical operation. And it is this, in this complementarity that the, the very sense of biomedia takes place. And I think in terms of archival procedures, we also have a great benefit in this term because if you want to store, archive, collect, and so on, we have to think of media. That means means of existence, which by definition, because they are media, are not considered having a non-agency. But we all know that biomedia differ from representational media in that sense, that they actually produce what they only pretend to mediate. And this is something also very important. And this is a kind of quantum physics observation question that you asked before. Are we, um, through the, the cho choice of the media, we're of course determining how we store what we want to conserve. And what is important aspects of an artwork? Is this material constitutions? Is this concept? Is the visual trace? Is this the audio trace? And therefore, I think the term of mediality becomes very crucial when it comes to archiving. Okay, but um, wouldn't you agree that, of course, uh, what is shown through these terminologies is also some dominance of some disciplines? In, and in this regard, maybe speaking out media is something that belongs to the 90s somehow. So maybe... The <laughs> so wouldn't we speak about the discourse rather? Or like if you say bio... I think, Howard, you talked about biological art. Did you use this term? I think, yeah, or or on something. And so, speaking about biotechnology, maybe it would be wider in the sense that it addresses biotechnology as a as a something that is really determining our age. Just, just a question. I mean, just quickly. <laughs> I think the, the media question, in the sense that I try to understand it, to go beyond operative interpretations of what the medium is, beyond the digital machines, is something that opens it up. And it also gives rise to interpretation that concern ecological scales. We have, I mean, a, a medial turn, of course, let's say the 90s, the 2000s. And actually, when you read books about object oriented optology, new materialism, it's about the ecological turn. It's about what Erich 
calls the general ecologization of thought and Timothy Morton and so on. So it's not the biotechnological microcosm, but it's a general ecology we're talking about. And But you can read this ecology as a milieu, right? And just, I think we have to broaden the scope of what the middle is. And that's why I think it encompasses a lot of dimensions in terms of scale, both temporal and spatial, that is uh, keeping it open. And I think that the definition of biotechnological makes it more in vitro than in vivo. Well, then we have environmental art that uh, <laughs> Adam can also say. So, Oram, please. Yes, so the. the uh, Howard was talking about him feeling like a, a contamination in the lab. I, I would claim that our art practice is also considered to be a contamination within the art world. And the naming of us is a way of putting us in a ghetto. So from a biosecurity perspective, so we won't enter the mainstream art world, um, you know, keeping, keeping us at the gates. Because you can see that people like Annika E or even Damien Hurst, they're showing living biological material in galleries, and they are called artists. No one decides to put a prefix in front of them because they are not considered to be risky contamination agents that somehow might disrupt the museum or the art world. So this whole titling of our field, and you know, this is one of the reasons why I titled my talk post Promethean Art, because yeah, we do need more names, more ghettos, more more borders, more biosecurity in order to keep the you know the evil at the gate. <laughs> Thank you. I think this discussion is opening up, but I, th I think I have some... Uh, <laughs> uh, Adam wants to say something. Do we have time? Um, can we? Huh? <laughs> That's the interesting part, yeah. So our soup is going to get cold, but uh, we will risk it, I think. Okay, Adam, the, please. Here's the soup getting cold. Okay. So um, recently it was discovered that these uh, genetically modified zebrafish are free living in the Amazon River. The glowfish have escaped. Uh, there's an outbreak of free living, contagious, eco-destabilizing GMO fish. And I don't know if it was an intentional release, but there's some xenophobia about them being alien. And at the same time, they, they escape from a pet farm and they are actually messing with the ecology of the Amazon. And I'm saying this because you, we talk about foreign species and their xenophobia, et cetera, but I'm leading into actually, Oran was talking and Yona were talking about um, psychopathology of control and the fetish of technology. And I think you know that you're you're actually critiquing the normal. You're critiquing, what do you call it, the, the square and beige. But you're critiquing it by insulting it, by calling it psychotic and a fetish. And I take offense, right? I'm talking about LGBTQ stuff. I'm talking about non-normative um, neurological contingencies. And you're sort of insulting all these people uh, by by trying to insult the, the square and the beige. And I, I want you to think about um, how to pose fetish and psychotic as queer, even if it's venal, as also like find a way to accept, because I think we're all, you know, part of, what is it? Biodiversity itself is perversion. I mean, that's how it happened. So. I think you've heard this all before. I love you, but I'm talking like a, these are contagious ideas. So maybe, and uh, feel free. That's a question for, for, or for you, not. You want to respond, you not? Okay. Um, Yuri, you wanted to say something? <laughs> Oh no, I just loved it. Thank you. It was really, um, yeah, beautifully said. Yeah, and I think, yeah, queer all the way, definitely. And um, yeah, let's get away from the square bench. Just to put in context, a yeah. work from 2018, Biomass, you know, we gave a, a brief to Natural History Museum curators to come up with life forms in their collection that bring into question our ideas about you know, what it means to have a body, what's the idea of self, individuality, sex, gender, and reproduction. 
And those beige people were just so into it. And, and they thanked us for finally giving them an opportunity to show how queer nature is actually is. Uh, you know, so we might be kind of including all of those things within our questioning of, of what constitutes being alive, what constitutes being a biological body, uh, in, including being beige. And, you know, just going to, uh... It was Timothy Morton that he said that, you know, the word nature is actually um, racist or, or normative because it does tell us, you know, what's supposed to be normal or abnormal. And, and we all know that nature, whatever it is, is, you know, very different to what we think um, normal clear. is. Yeah, it's completely clear. That's wonderful, isn't it? Okay. Now uh, we'll have the last question from the audience. I think you have a question, Yuri, right? Yeah, um, I will try to uh, to frame it right. Although the English it's really poor, no. But um, um, here, when we were talking about um, uh, life and metaphors, no. Um, here, I believe that um, we are coming to uh, one point where artists dealing with life, meaning not life in general, but more like Aristotelian understanding of Zoe and Bios. And here we have Zoe um, as a form of life which is inherent to all living sp uh, species, which we would need to add also Fito here, not just Zoe. You know? um, and um, I'm referring here to what Jens was developing before, that it's not metaphoric, it's metabolic, what we, it's in front of us. And um, what I'm lacking here uh, in, in this discussion, also in the lectures was, you know, that the position of artist as something that is excluded from um, um, uh, dealing uh, with uh, um, uh, scientific uh, procedures and using technology as uh, they uh, can do with that whatever they want because um, they are um, um, they're uh, entitled to do uh, that because they are artists. Now, what I am lacking here is the word responsibility, which is something that um, we need to bring in when we are talking about uh, um, researching um, and working with um, living things, uh, making art uh, with uh, living things, and also how we are dealing after um, with it. So the responsibility is something that is tackled by ethics. And as we know, uh, ethics, ethics is not something fixed. It's constantly changing. What was ethical sometimes, it's not ethical now, and what was, uh, and the vice versa. So, um, here, um, I think that we need to position uh, our um, demand for a more appropriate wordings when we are describing uh, what uh, the artists are doing and also what is happening in our laboratories, artistic laboratories, and in our galleries. Um, the, yeah, I, I don't think this is this is fun, no, because um, we are not living uh, uh, um, alone in this world. You know, so um, these questions are coming from my frustration when producing this kind of artworks. When we need to deal with uh, scientific institutes and with uh, researchers of various kinds, and where they are seeing artists as something um, not important or just something that brings uh, uh, some aesthetization and commodification of what they are uh, of what they are doing and even when we are for example coming up with some important uh, uh, messages through the artwork the majority of the critique it's you know like they are they are not serious. They are, you know, making art. Art is not serious. And although that we are fighting now for more than 25 years for being heard, and uh, not only for the uh, general public, but uh, also to the scientific community. Uh, so 
um, I think that um, here, um, one in a sudden, when we are talking about life, you know, as as Zoe, and and uh, um, that we got an opportunity to set some of the criteria where we can uh, um, choose between, uh, for example, hard works that are pure bio fascination and are abusing uh, um, um, the fascination of life as such, and something that it's really uh, um, bringing a powerful message is that we need to reconsider our point of perception as humans. Uh, uh, to uh, to it. So, this is where I'm seeing this question of of Polona. You know that we project our culture in everything we understand. You know, and that it's uh, uh, that we need to open up to um, um, not rationalistic approaches and to more different kind of cognitions when we're encountering uh, this, I would say, miracle of, of, of life. You know? um, so um, I, I was um, hoping, or I'm still hoping, you know, that we could develop uh, that kind of discourse that we, that it could help us, it can help us to bring in front uh, um, um, the, the importance uh, of, of this field and um, also to maybe rethink uh, the describing of uh, this kind of uh, uh, art production through of course, of course, not using uh, uh, bio art as we were, use, we were using, I don't know, net art, male art, and, and so on, because it's, it's flattering the whole discourse. Um, and, and, but I still uh, uh, feel that when we are using biomedia, which I'm using it uh, all the time, it's, uh, we are still uh, trying to comp, comp, comp uh, mentar, com, com, ne, com, yeah, I cannot pronounce. Uh, to, um, um, and and uh, because nowadays art production is not disciplinary anymore. You know, uh, artists use uh, 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 different uh, means uh, to express to uh, to express themselves according to what they want to express so they are not bio artists they are not visual artists they are not sound artists or intermediate artists anymore so um, coming to to uh, my uh, um, um, humble efforts to uh, over past that um, is we are trying to call what we are doing contemporary investigative arts where we are abandoned media uh, because it's already infected with with meanings you know media is a message already and um, maybe this is uh, not a good uh, uh, um, use of words but it does uh, point more on the how we approach to work and to deal with this. Uh, uh, it is it's more about methods, not methodology, because there is none. No, it's more an approach and more maybe a milieu, as as you said. No, but it's somehow alternating around by not uh, naming with one word what uh, what are we doing. So these these are just my comments. I actually has no uh, have no concrete uh, question. Somebody wants to shortly comment, or Jens wants to comment. Yeah, I totally agree. It's not a question of how to substitute one ism with another, which is a modernist feature. I mean, there is post-internet art, which, in terms of the digital media, has done the same. And it didn't help much but because there's a freedom of all the practices. I'm very concerned about, for example, how this total totalitarian machine of NFT is actually pushing it all through a kind of flattening iron of uh, pseudo mediality. 
and in how far the new medial is in fact a kind of um, abstract oikos that has an eco economical feature before having an ecological one and seemingly trying to use new media and cryptocurrencies that are not uh, investigated in the epistemological and the technological sense to order to integrate it all into kind of new art. So currently, I think, for example, there needs to be a resistance also from this movement to, to reinvest what the oikos means. And the oikos in terms of both the metaphorical, the, the, the etymological root for economy and ecology, especially in the times where this media art now is absorbed by a kind of financial bubble that tries to sell us a kind of NFT made by an artist at the same level than the smile of Melania, Melanie Trump. Right? And I think I see a danger there that the, the, the insisting of mediation is a kind of progressive tool uh, comes through the back door of the NFT industry right now. And there's a great deal, I think, of resistance that even artists working with real materialities to claim their field because of the need of the Eucharist to reconcile the economy and the ecological. And I think it goes a little bit in your direction. But I think that the medial comes back right now in a very unexpected way and in a very contrary sense of what we are trying to do here. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, I just want to ask, how is, it, how is a database, even of biological art or any kind of database of art, how is that different from an NFT? I don't just, I mean, in, as far as digitization and scarcity and also ability to download at the same time. And uh, we have uh, Oron, you wanted to comment? Yeah, yes, uh, I just wanted to comment about uh, the point that you, uh, you already uh, raised in regard to ethics and not being taken seriously. And I think those two things are connected when it comes to art. So uh, as Martin Kemp said, art is a, a function, but not a utility. And by artists who are working with issues that are confronting our perceptions in regard to life and its manipulation, without any solutionist or utilitarian outcome for it, we, we distill the ethical issues. We point a finger at with the issues that need to be resolved that many of the people who are engaged in research in this field are not interested in exploring because they see it as some form of a hindrance. And they hide behind utility. And, and the only way that artists can actually do it and speak truth to power in a sense is by not being taken seriously. This is the lesson we learned from the court gesture. Yeah? If we want to, our heads to, to roll, we, we try to get ourselves being taken seriously, but then we can either not tell truth to power or we're not going to last very long. Thank you very much. Thank you, the panelists. Thanks to the public and thanks to Kapilica Gallery that enabled this great panel, this great event that I really enjoyed very much. It was a great pleasure for me. So thank you for these good discussions and excellent papers. And now we are hungry. <laughs> we go to lunch and uh, you, I suppose, it's pretty late there in Perth. So good night to you. <laughs> So much to have you, to be with you. <laughs> have you here at Symbiotica? Thank you. <laughs>